All right. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry about the confusion there. I had originally intended this to be uh, going live on Twitch. <laughs> Thank you, Kafri. I'm glad you're excited to have us here. Um, but yes, tonight we are going to be going over the wind in the willows again. Um, as we noticed last time, this is a fairly long book, so I'm expecting this to go for several hours. Um, if by the end of it I have enough extra time, energy, what have you, um, I might switch over to trying to play some games on stream, just to shake things up a little bit. Um, but one thing at a time. Um, I'm going to give just a... Oh, uh, yes, of course, Caffrey, have fun with your lurk. Um, I am going to give just a few minutes here in order to uh, kind of let people filter in. Um, so I actually messed up at the start of things here. Um, I had been intending to stream on YouTube tonight rather than Twitch. However, um, a friend of mine and Easy's decided to not notice when I had started going live and wanted to be able to make it to some of these streams. So, um, I am actually going to be streaming here on Twitch for tonight. Have I heard of the dragon? Um, which dragon are you referring to, Naruto? I'm um, certainly a fan of different types of mythology and folklore. Um... No? No, I'm not certain I've heard of a dragon named these Nuts. Um, is this a particularly commonly known dragon? Um, can you tell me a little bit more about the story behind this dragon? Um, these Nuts does not sound particularly familiar. I I'm not even certain what language that would be from. Um, so can you tell me a little bit more about this culture? <laughs> Hello, Rage. Thank you for joining in. It's good to see you. Um, but yeah, no, Naruto, I, I'm quite fond of tales about dragons, so if you happen to have one, a Deesnuts joke, um, well, I'm, I'm still not certain who Deesnuts is, um, are, is this a particularly popular creature, or was Deesnuts the main character and the dragon just happens to be involved somehow? I'd certainly like to know more about this. Especially if, you know, this is something that you care about. I, I want to be able to make this a community where we can share different stories. Um, so, yeah, by, by all means. Um, <laughs> hello, Lucy. It's good to see you. Thank you for dropping in. Um, so, for tonight, we are going to just be doing the second half of uh, The Wind in the Willows. Um, so for those of you who weren't able to make it to the previous stream, uh, last time we got to meet Mr. Mole and Mr. Water Rat, who are quite good friends and have been living together alongside a river. Um, and as time's gone by, they've gotten to connect with many different animals in the forest, including Mr. Badger and Mr. Toad. Um, just leave the joke behind? Alright, well, I suppose we shall. But, Naruto, if you ever do find some information about this hero, I'd be more than happy to come up with a proper story and... Yes, Naruto, you will also notice that although there are female animals mentioned in these stories, the cast and speaking members are exclusively or almost exclusively male. This is certainly the case. Um, now, I wouldn't necessarily hazard much of a guess on things, but Mr. Mole certainly did have several beds for somebody who lives in just a single place. If they are gay, which I have no reason to doubt, then they are fantastically companionable folk, and I would be more than happy to see these people as a representation <laughs> Well, thank you for cuddling up there, Rage. 
It's good to have you with me. As for what's happened, though, Mr. Toad has become completely obsessed with cars, to the point that he decided to steal one and go for a joyride. In the middle of Mr. Badger attempting to help break him of the habit of automobiles. As a result, Mr. Toad has been sentenced to over 20 years in jail. And so, we will have to see how this progresses. The willow wren was twittering, his thin little song, hidden himself in the dark sped, uh, salvage of the river bank. Though it was past 10 o'clock at night, the sky still clung to and retained some lingering skirts of the light from the departed day, and the sullen heats of the torrid afternoon broke up and rolled away at the dispersing touch of the cool fingers of the short midsummer night. Mole lay stretched on the bank, still panting from the stress of the fierce day that had been cloudless from dawn to late sunset, and waited for his friend to return. He had been on the river with some other companions, leaving the water rat free to keep an engagement of long standing with Otter, and he had come back to find the house dark and deserted and no sign of Rat, who was doubtless keeping it up late with his old comrade. It was still too hot to think of staying indoors, so he lay on some cool dock leaves and thought over the past day and its doings, and how very good they had been. Yes, Nardo. Grand Theft Auto. The rat's light footfall was presently heard approaching over the parched grass. Oh, blessed coolness. Oh, blessed coolness, he said, and sat down, gazing thoughtfully on the river, silent and preoccupied. You stayed for supper, of course, said the mole presently. I simply had to, said the rat. They wouldn't hear of my going before, you know how kind they always are, and they made things as jolly for me as ever they could, right up to the moment I left. But I felt a brute at all the time, as it was clear to me they were very unhappy, though they tried to hide it. Mo, I'm afraid they're in trouble. Little Portly is missing again, you know how, what a lot his father thinks of him, though he never says much about it. Hello, Lexi. Thank you for joining in. It's good to see you. Wait, the child? said the mole lightly. Well, I suppose he is. Why worry about it? He's always staying off and getting lost and turning up again. He's so adventurous, but no harm ever happens to him. Everybody hereabouts knows him and likes him, just as they do, old otter, and you may be sure some other animal will come across him and bring him back again all right. Why, we've found ourselves miles from home and quite self-possessed and cheerful. Yes, but this time it's more serious, said Rat gravely. He's been missing for some days now. And the otters have hunted everywhere, high and low, without finding the slightest trace. And they've asked every animal, too, for miles around, and no one knows anything about him. Otters evidently more anxious than he'll admit. And I got out of him that young Portly hasn't learned to swim very well yet, and I can see he's thinking of a... Uh, I can see he's thinking of a weir. There's a lot of water coming down still. Considering the time of year and the place always had a fascination for the child. And then there are, well, traps and things. You know, Otter's not the fellow to be nervous about any son of his before it's time. And now he is nervous. When I left, he came out with me, said he wanted some air, and talked about stretching his legs. But I could see it wasn't that. So I drew him out and pumped him and got all that from him at last. He was going to spend the night watching by the ford. You know the place where the old ford used to be in bygone days before they built the bridge? I knew it well. But why should Otter choose to watch there? Well, it seems that there he gave Portly his first swimming lesson, continued the rat, from the shallow, gravelly spit near the bank. And it was there that he used to teach him fishing, and there young Portly caught his first fish, of which he was so very proud. The child loved the spot, and Otter thinks if he came wandering back from wherever he is, if he is anywhere by this time, or 
little chap. He might make for the ford he was so fond of, or if he came across it, he'd remember it well and stop there and play, perhaps. So Otto goes there every night and watches on the off chance, you know, just on the chance. They were silent for a time, both thinking of the same thing. The lonely heart saw an animal touched by the ford, watching and waiting the long night through on the chance. Um, in this context, Naruto, pumped him would mean pumping him for information. Um, it would mean a form of directed and pressed questioning that would encourage Otter to give up the information, despite his own hesitations and desires for the alternative. Well, well, said the rat presently. I suppose we ought to be thinking about turning in. But he never offered to move. The rat... They simply can't go and turn in and go to sleep and do nothing, even though there doesn't seem to be anything to be done. We'll get the boat out and paddle upstream. The moon will be up in an hour or so, and then we'll search as well as we can. Anyhow, it will be better than just going to bed and doing nothing. Just what I was thinking myself, said the rat. It's not the right sort of bed, not right sort of night for bed anyhow, and daybreak is not so very far off. And here we may pick up some news from the early rises as we go along. They got out of, they got the boat out, and Rat took the skulls, paddling with caution. Out in midstream, there was a clear, narrow track that faintly reflected the sky, but wherever shadows fell on the water from bank, brush, or tree, they were as solid to all appearance as the bank themselves and the mole had to steer with judgment accordingly. Dark and deserted as it was, the night was full of small noises, song and chatter and rustling, telling of the very busy population who were up and about, plying their trades and vacations through the night till sunshine should fall on them at last and send them off to their well-earned repose. The water's own noises, too, were more apparent than by day, its gurglings and groups more unexpected and near at hand and constantly they started at what seemed a sudden, clear call from an ar actual articulate voice. The line of the horizon was hard and clear against the sky, and in one particular quarter it showed black against a silvery climbing phosphorescence that grew and grew. At last, over the rim of the waiting earth, the moon lifted with slow majesty till it swung clear of the horizon and rode off, free of moorings, and once more they began to see circuses, meadow widespread and quiet gardens and the river itself from bank to bank, all softly disclosed, all washed clean of mystery and terror, all radiant again as by day, but with a difference that was tremendous. Their old haunts greeted them again in other raiment, as if they had slipped away and put on this pure new apparel and come quietly back smiling as they shyly waited to see if they would be recognized again under it. Fastening their boat to a willow, the friends landed in the silent silver kingdom and patiently explored the hedges, the hollow trees, the runnels, and the little coverts, the ditches, and the dry waterways. Embarking again and crossing over, they worked their way up the stream in this manner, while the moon, serene and detached in a cloudless sky, did what she could, though so far off, to help them in their quest, till her hour came and she sank earthward reluctantly, and left them, and mystery once more held fields and river. Then a change began to slowly declare himself. The horizon became clearer, field and tree came into sight, and somehow, with a different look, the mystery began to drop away from them, a bird piped suddenly and was still, and a light breeze sprang up and set the reeds and bulrushes rustling. Rat, who was in the stern of the boat while Mole sculled, sat up suddenly and listened with a passionate intentness. Mole, who with gentle strokes was just keeping the boat moving while he scanned the banks with care, looked at him with curiosity. It's gone, sighed the rat, sinking into his seat again. So beautiful and strange and new. Since it was soon to end soon, I almost would have liked to have never heard it. What has roused a longing in me that is pain, 
and nodding over what seems worthwhile, but to hear that sound once more and go listening to it forever. Ah, there it is again, he cried once more. Entranced, he was silent for a long space, spellbound. Ah, it passes on and I begin to lose it, he said presently. Ah, mole, the beauty of it. The may bubble and jaw, a tin clear, happy call of the distant piping. So much music I never dreamed of. And the call in it is stronger even than the sweet music is. Row on, mole, row. For the music and the call must be for us. The mole, greatly wondering, obeyed. I hear nothing myself but the wind playing in the reeds and the rushes and the osiers. The rat never answered, if indeed he heard. Wrapped, tra transported, trembling, he was possessed in all his senses by this new divine thing that caught up his helpless soul and swung and dangled it, a powerless but happy infant in the strong, sustaining grass. In silence, Mole rode steadily, and soon there came a point to where the river divided, a long backwater branching off to one side. With a slight movement of his head, the rat, who had long dropped the rudder lines, directed the rower to take the backwater. The creeping tide of light gained and gained, and now they could see the color of the flowers that gemmed the water's edge. They're nearer still, said the rat joyously. Now oh, you must surely hear. Ah, at last, I say you do. Breathless and transfixed, the mole stopped rowing as the liquid run of the glad piping broke on him like a wave, caught him up and possessed him utterly. He saw the tears on his comrade's cheek and bowed his head and understood. For a space they hung there, brushed by the purple loose strife that had fringed the bank. Then the clear imperious summons that marched hand in hand with the intoxicating melody imposed its will on mole, and mechanically he bent to his oars again and the light grew steadily stronger, but no birds sang, as they were wont to do at the approach of dawn, and but for the heavenly music, all was marvellously still. On either side of them, as they glided onwards, the rich meadow grass seemed the morning of a freshness and a greenness unsurpassable. Never had they noticed the roses so vivid, the willow herbs so riotous, the meadow sweet so odorous and pervading. Then the murmur of the approaching weir began to hold in the air, and they felt a consciousness they were nearing the end, whatever it might be, that surely awaited their expedition. A wide half-circle of foam and glinting lights and shining shoulders of green water, the great weir closed the backwater from bank to bank, troubled all the quiet surface with twirling eddies and floating foam streaks, and deadened all other sounds with its solemn and soothing rumble. In midmost of the stream, embraced in the weir's shimmering and arm spread, a small island lay anchored, fringed close with willow and silver birch and alder. Reserved, shy, but full of significance, it hid whatever it might hold behind a veil, keeping it till the hour should come, and, with the hour, those who were called and chosen. Slowly, but with no doubt or hesitation whatever, and in something of a solemn expectancy, the two animals passed through the broken, tumultuous water and moored their boat to the flowery margin of the island. In silence they landed and pushed through the blossom and scented herbage and underground that led to the level ground, till they stood on a little lawn of marvellous green set round with nature's own orchard trees, crabapple, wild cherry, and slough. This is the place of my song dream, the place the music played to me, whispered the rat as if in a trance. Here in this holy place, if anywhere, surely we will find him. Then suddenly the mole felt a great awe fall upon him, an awe that turned his muscles to water, bowed his head, and rooted his feet to the ground. It was no panic terror, indeed, he felt wonderfully at peace and happy, but it was an awe that smote and held him, and without seeing, he knew it could only mean that some, uh, some august presence was very, very near. 
With difficulty, he turned to look for his friend, and saw him at his side, howled, stricken, and trembling violently. And still there was an utter silence in the populous bird-haunted branches around him, and still the lights grew and grew. Perhaps he would never have dared to raise his eyes, but that, though the piping was now hushed, the call and the summons seemed still dominant and imperious. He might not refuse, were death himself waiting to strike him instantly once he had looked with mortal eye on things rightly kept hidden. Trembling, he obeyed, and raised his humble head, and there, in the utter clearness of the imminent dawn, while nature, flushed with fullness of incredible colors, seemed to hold her breath for the event, he looked in the very eyes of the friend and helper, saw the backward sweep of the curved horns gleaming in the glowing daylight, saw the stern hooked nose between the kindly eyes that were looking down on them humorously, while the bearded mouth broke into a half-smile at the corners, saw the rippling muscles on the arm that lay across the broad chest, the long, supple hand still holding the pan-pipes only just fallen away from the parted lips, saw the splendid curves of the shaggy limbs disposed to majestic ease on the sward, saw, last of all, nestling between his very hooves, sleeping soundly an entire peace and contentment, the little round, pudgy, childish form of the baby otter. All this he saw for one moment breathless and intense, vivid on the morning sky. Still as he looked, he lived, and still as he lived, he wondered. That, he found breath to whisper, shaking. Are you afraid? Afraid? murmured the rat, his eyes shining with unutterable love. Afraid? Of him? Oh, never. Never. And yet... And yet... Oh, Mole, I am afraid. Then the two animals, crouching to the earth, bowed their heads and did worship. Sudden and magnificent, the sun's broad golden disk showed itself over the horizon facing them, and the first rays shooting across the level water meadows took the animals full in the eyes and dazzled them. When they were able to look once more, the vision had vanished, and the air was full of the carol of birds that hailed the dawn. As they stared blankly in dumb misery, deepening as they slowly realized they all had seen and all had lost. A capricious little breeze, dancing up from the surface of the water, touched the aspens, shook the dewy roses, and blew lightly and caressingly in their faces, and with its soft touch came instant oblivion. For this is the last, best gift the kindly demigod is capable to bestow on those to whom he has revealed himself in their helping, the gift of forgetfulness, lest an awful remembrance should remain and grow, and overshadow mirth and pleasure, and great haunting memories should spoil all the afterlives of the little animals helped out of difficulties, in order that they should be happy and light-hearted as before. Mole rubbed his eyes and stared at Rat, who was looking about him in a puzzled sort of way. I beg your pardon. What did you say, Rat? I think I was only remarking. This look was the right sort of place. Uh, here, if anywhere, we should find him. And look, what there he is, the little fellow. With a cry of delight, he ran toward the slumbering portly. But Mole stood a moment, held in thought, as one wakened suddenly from a beautiful dream who struggles to recall it and can recapture nothing but a dim sense of the beauty of it. That beauty! Till that, too, fades away in its turn, and the dreamer bitterly accepts the hard and cold waking and all its penalties. So Mole, after struggling with his memory for a brief space, shook his head sadly and followed the rat. Well, that was quite the experience. <laughs> hmm. Bordley woke up with a joyous squeak and wriggled with pleasure at the sight of his father's friends, who had played with him so often in past days. In a moment, however, his face grew blank, 
and fell to haunting round in a circle with pleading whine. As a child that has fallen happily asleep in its nurse's arms and wakes to find itself alone and laid in a strange place, and searches corners and cupboards and runs from room to room, despair growing silently in its heart, even so Portly searched the island, and searched, dogged and unwearying, till at last the black moment came for giving it up and sitting down and crying bitterly. The mole ran quickly to comfort the little animal, but Rat, lingering, looked long and doubtfully at certain hoof marks deep in the sward. Some great animal has been here, he murmured slowly and thoughtfully, and stood, musing, musing, his mind strangely stirred. Come along, Rat. Think of poor Otter waiting up there by the ford. Portly had soon been comforted by the promise of a treat, a jaunt on the river in Mr. Rat's real boat, and the two animals conducted him to the water's side, placed him securely between them in the bottom of the boat, and paddled off down the backwater. The sun was fully up by now, and hot on them the birds sang lustily without restraint. The flowers smiled and nodded from either bank, but somehow, so thought the animals, with less riches and blaze of colour than they seemed to remember seeing quite recently somewhere. They wondered where. The main river reached again. They turned the boat's head upstream, toward the point where they knew their friend was keeping his lonely vigil. As they drew near the familiar ford, the mole took the boat into the bank, and they lifted Portly out and set him on his legs on the towpath, and gave him his marching orders in a friendly farewell, pat on the back, and shoved him out into midstream. They watched the little animal as he waddled along the path contentedly, and with importance, watched him till they saw his muzzle suddenly lift and his waddle break into a clumsy amble as he quickened his pace with shrill whines and wriggles of recognition. Looking up the river, they could see Otter start up, tense and rigid, from out the shallows where he crouched in dumb patience, and could hear his amazed and joyous bark as he bounded up through the osiers onto the path. Then the mole, with a strong pull on one oar, swung the boat round and let the full stream bear them down again, whither it would, their quest now happily ended. I feel strangely tired, Rat said the mole, leaning wearily over his oars as the boat drifted. It's being up all night, you'll say, perhaps, but that's nothing. We do as much half the nights of the week at this time of the year. No, I feel as if I had been through something very exciting and rather terrible, and it was just over, and yet nothing particular has happened. Or oh, something very surprising and splendid and beautiful, murmured the rat leaning back and closing his eyes. I feel just as you do, Mole. Simply dead tired, though not body tired. It's lucky we've got the stream to take with us, to take us home. Isn't it jolly to feel the sun again soaking in one's bones, and hark to the wind playing in the reeds? It's like music. Far away music, said the Mole, nodding drowsily. So I was thinking, murmured the rat, dreamful and languid. Dance music, a lilting sort that runs on without a stop, but with words in it too. It passes into words and out of them again. I catch them at intervals. Then it is dance music once more, and then nothing but the reeds. Soft, thin, whispering. You hear better than I, said the mole sadly. I cannot catch the words. Or oh, let me try and give you them, said the rat softly, his eyes still closed. Now it is turning into words again, faint but clear. Lest the all should dwell and turn your frolic to fret. You shall look upon my power at the helping hour, but then you shall forget. Now the reeds take it up, forget, 
forget. We sigh and it dies away in a rustle and a whisper. And the voice returns. Those limbs be reddened and rent. I spring the trap that is set. As I loose the snare, you may glimpse me there, for surely you shall forget. Grow nearer and more nearer to the raids, it is hard to catch and grows fainter each minute. Elbow and healer I share, small waifs in the wood and wet. Strays are finding it, found, wounds are binding it, bidding them all forget. Near a near oh no, it's no good. The song has died away into reed talk. But what do the words mean? asked the wandering mole. I, I do not know, said the rat simply. I passed them all to you as they reached me. Ah, now they return again, and this time full and clear. This time at last it is the real, unmistakable thing. Simple. Passionate and perfect. Well, let's have it then, said the mole after he waited patiently for a few minutes, half dozing in the hot sun. But no answer came. He looked and understood the silence, with a smile of much happiness on his face and something of a listening look still lingering there. The weary rat was fast asleep. Mm. Sorry, I haven't uh, had a chance to get supper in here, but if I didn't get started, it was going to get too late. So I will be periodically stopping just briefly to munch. I wonder how everyone's enjoying the story, though. I know this one didn't have at all to do with Toad, but honestly, I kind of like that. It was a fascinating sequence. Chapter 8 Toad's Adventures When Toad found himself immured in a dank and noisome dungeon, and knew that all the grim darkness of a medieval fortress lay between him and the outer world of sunshine and well metalled high roads, where he had lately been so happy, disporting himself as if he had brought up every road in England, he flung himself at full length on the floor and shed bitter tears and abandoned himself to dark despair. <laughs> Hello, Alex. I'm not quite certain why we need to get a fable, or glamour, but I'm glad you've decided to join us. Let's see, where did I leave off? Well, I suppose I shall simply have to start again. <laughs> when Toad found himself immured in the dank and noisome dungeon, and knew that all the grim darkness of the medieval fortress lay between him and the outer world of sunshine and well-metalled high roads, where he had lately been so happy, disporting himself as if he had brought up every road in England, he flung himself at full length on the floor and shed bitter tears, and abandoned himself to dark despair. This is the end of everything. He said. At least it is the end of the career of Toad, which is the same thing. A popular and handsome Toad, a rich and hospitable Toad. A toad so carefree and careless and debonair. How can I hope to ever set a large again? Who have been imprisoned so justly for stealing so handsome a motor car in such an audacious manner? And while such lurid and imaginative cheek bestowed upon a number of fat, red-faced policemen. Here is Sobs choked him. Stupid animal that I was. Now I must languish in this dungeon till people who were proud to say they knew me have forgotten the very name of Toad. A oh, wise old badger, a oh, clever, intelligent rat and sensible mole. What sound judgments, what a knowledge of men and matters you possess. Oh, unhappy and forsaken toad. 
With lamentations such as these, he passed his days and nights for several weeks, refusing his meals or intermediate light refreshments. Though the grim and ancient jailer, knowing that Toad's pockets were well lined, frequently pointed out that many comforts, and indeed luxuries, could be a, by arrangement sent in, at a price, from the outside. Glamour used to disguise himself. <laughs> well, that sounds quite nice, Alex, and thank you for the lurk. Now the jailer had a daughter, a pleasant bunch and good-hearted, who assisted her father in the light duties of his post. She was particularly fond of animals, and besides her canary, whose cage hung on a nail in the massive wall of the keep by day, to the great annoyance of prisoners who relished an after-dinner nap, and was shrouded in an anti-mass... antimic... anti-macassar? Hmm. I don't think I've seen that word before. Anti Macassar. <laughs> On the parlor table at night, she kept several piebald mice and a restless revolving squirrel. This kind hearted girl, pitying the misery of Toad, said to her father one day, Father, I can't bear to see that poor beast so unhappy and getting so thin. You let me have the managing of him. You know how fond of animals I am. I'll make him eat from my hand and sit up and do all sorts of things. Her father replied that she could do what she liked with him. He was tired of Toad and his sulks and his airs and his meanness. So that day she went on in her errand of mercy and knocked on the door of Toad's cell. And now cheer up, Toad, she said coaxingly on entering, and sit up and dry your eyes and be a sensible animal. And do try to eat a bit of dinner. See, I've brought you some of mine, hot from the oven. It was bubble and squeak between two plates, and its fragments filled the narrow cell. The penetrating smell of cabbage reached the nose of Toad as he lay prostrate in his misery on the floor, and gave him the idea for a moment that perhaps life was not such a blank and desperate thing as he had imagined. But still he waited and kicked out with his legs and refused to be comforted. So the wise girl retired for the time, but of course a good deal of the smell of hot cabbage remained behind, as it will do. And Toad, between his sobs, sniffed and reflected, and gradually began to think of new and inspiring thoughts, of chivalry and poetry and deeds to be done, of broad meadows and cattle browsing in them, raked by sun and wind, of kitchen gardens and straighter borders and warm snapdragon beset by bees, and of the comforting clink of dishes set down on the table at Toad Hall, and the scrape of chair legs on the floor as everyone pulled himself close to his work. The air of the narrow cell took a rosy tinge. He began to think of his friends and how they would surely be able to do something, of lawyers and how they would have enjoyed his case, and what an ass he had been not to get in a few. And lastly, he thought of how his own great cleverness and resource, and all that he was capable of, if only he gave his great mind to it, and the cure was almost complete. That is a very, very prostrate toad. <laughs> oh dear. When the girl returned some hours later, carrying a tray with a cup of fragrant tea steaming on it, and a plate piled up with very hot buttered toast, cup thick, very brown on both sides, with butter running through the holes in it in great golden drops, like honey from a honeycomb. The smell of that buttered toast simply talked to Toad, and with no uncertain voice. Talked of warm kitchens, of breakfasts on bright, frosty mornings, of cozy parlor firesides on winter evenings when one's ramble was over, and slippered feet propped on the fender, of the purring and contented cats, and the twitter of sleepy canaries. Toad sat up on end once more, dried his eyes, sipped his tea and munched his toast, and soon began talking freely about himself and the house he lived in and his doings there, and how important he was, and what a lot his friends thought of him. The jailer's daughter saw that the topic was doing him as much good as the tea, as indeed it was, and encouraged him to go on. Tell me about Toad Hall, said she. 
It sounds beautiful. Toad Hall, said the toad proudly. Is an eligible, self-contained gentleman's residence, very unique, dating in part to the 14th century, but replete with every modern convenience, up-to-date sanitation, five minutes from church, post office and golf links, suitable for... Bless the animal, I don't want to take it. Tell me something real about it. But first, wait till I fetch you some more tea and toast. She tripped away and presently returned with a fresh trayful, and Toad, pitching into the toast with avidity, his spirits quite restored to their usual level, told her about the boathouse and the fish pond and the old walled kitchen garden, and about the pig styles and the stables and the pigeon house and the hen house, and about the dairy and the wash house, and the china cupboards, and the linen presses. She liked that bit especially. And about the banqueting hall, and the fun they had there when the other animals were gathered round the table, and Toad was at his best, singing songs, telling stories, carrying on generally. Then she wanted to know about his animal friends, and what was very interested in all that he had to tell her about them, and about how they lived and what they did to pass their time. Legal, thank you very much for the compliments. You're quite the cutie yourself. Of course, she did not say she was fond of animals as pets, because she had the sense to see that Toad would be extremely offended. When she said goodnight, having filled his water jug and shaken up his straw for him, Toad was very much the same sanguine, self-satisfied animal he had been of old. He sang a little song or two, of the sort he used to sing at his dinner parties, curled himself up in the straw and had an excellent night's sleep, rest, and the pleasantest of dreams. They had many interesting talks together, after that, as the dreary days went on, and the jailer's daughter grew very sorry for Toad, and thought it was a great shame that a poor little animal should be locked up in prison for what seemed to her a very trivial offence. Old lady, whatever do you mean, Naruto? Toad, of course, in his vanity, thought that her interest in him proceeded from a growing tenderness, and he could not help half regretting that the social gulf between them was so very wide, for she was a comely lass, and evidently admired him very much. Me? Well, now, why would you go out of your way to say it, that, Naruto? I don't think you're entirely wrong, although old might be a bit of a stretch. I'm not so ancient. But I certainly have a few years. There's no shame in admitting that. After all, each of those years is a year that I spent making sure I would continue on for another year. And that's its own thing. I hope everyone can find some joy and comfort in that. Even if it becomes rather difficult. B, I'm delighted to see you. Thank you for dropping in. One morning, the girl was very thoughtful and answered at random, and did not seem to Toad to be paying proper attention to his witty sayings and sparkling comments. Toad, she said presently, just listen, please. I have an aunt who is a washerwoman. There, there, said Toad graciously and affably. Never mind, think no more about it. I have several aunts who ought to be washerwomen. Do be quiet a minute, Toad, said the girl. You talk too much. That's your chief fault, and I'm trying to think, and you hurt my head. As I said, I have an aunt who is a washerwoman. She does the washing for all the prisoners in the castle. We try to keep any paying business of that sort in the family, you understand. She takes out the washing on Monday morning and brings it in on Friday evening. This is a Thursday. Now, this is what occurs to me. You're very rich, at least you're always telling me so, and she's very poor. A few pounds would make any difference to you, and it would mean a lot to her. Now, I think if she were properly approached, squared, I believe is the word you animals use it, you could come to the some arrangement by which she would let you have her dress and bonnet and so on, and you could escape from the castle as the official washerwoman. You're very alike in many respects, particularly about the figure. Oh no, she just said her aunt 
has the same figure as a toad. <laughs> okay, in a positive way, I remind you of an old witch in a cabin that tells stories. Well, I'm delighted that that's the impression you get, Naruto. And I'm quite happy to have such comparisons drawn. It may have been some of the intent behind the designs, but it may simply have been a reflection of me, as I hope most of the stream is. We're not, said the toad in a huff. I have a very elegant figure for what I am. <laughs> so has my aunt, replied the girl. For what she is, but have it your own way, you horrid, proud, ungrateful animal, but I'm sorry for you and trying to help you. Yes, yes, that's all right. Thank you very much indeed, said the toad hurriedly. But look here, you wouldn't surely have Mr. Toad of Toad Hawk going about the country disguised as a washerwoman. <laughs> then you can stop here as a toad, replied the girl with much spirit. I suppose you want to go off in a coach and four. Honest Toad was always ready to admit himself in the wrong. You're a good, kind, clever girl, and I am indeed a proud and stupid Toad. Introduce me to your worthy aunt if you will be so kind. I have no doubt that the excellent lady and I will be able to arrange terms satisfactory to both parties. Next evening, the girl ushered her aunt into Toad's cell, bearing his week's washing, pinned up in a towel. The old lady had been prepared beforehand for the interview, and the sight of certain gold sovereigns that Toad had thoughtfully placed on the table in full view practically completed the matter and left little further to discuss. In return for his cash, Toad received a cotton print gown, an apron, and a shawl, a rusty black bonnet, the only stipulation the old lady made being that she should be gagged and bound and dumped down in a corner. And by this not very convincing artifice, she explained, aided by picturesque fiction which she could herself supply, she hoped to retain her situation, in spite of the suspicious appearance of the things. She's asking to be tied up and gagged in a corner. Well, I suppose everybody has their own preferences. Toad was delighted with the suggestion. It would enable him to leave the prison in some style, and with his reputation for being a desperate and dangerous fellow untarnished, and he readily helped the jailer's daughter to make her aunt appear as much as possible the victim of circumstances over which she had no control. Now it's your turn. Oh. Now it's your turn, Toad, said the girl. Take off that coat and waistcoat of yours, you're fat enough as it is. Shaking with laughter, she proceeded. Look and I him into the cotton print gown, arranged the shawl with a professional fold, and tied the strings of the rusty bonnet under his chin. Hook and I. You know, I suspect that means she velcroed him in. Velcro being a brand name for a type of hook and latch fastener. Mm. You're the very image of her, she giggled. Only I'm sure you never looked half so respectable in all your life before. Now goodbye, Toad, and good luck. Go straight down the way you came up, and if anyone says anything to you, they pr as they probably will, being but men, you can chaff back a bit, of course. But remember, you're a widow woman, quite alone in the world, with a character to lose. With a quaking heart, but as firm a footstep as he could command, Toad set forth, cautiously, on what seemed to be the most harebrained and hazardous undertaking. But he was soon agreeably surprised to find how easy everything was made for him, and a little humbled at the thought that both his popularity and the sex that seemed to inspire it were really another's. The washwoman's squat figure in his familiar cotton print seemed a passport for every barred door and grim gateway, even when he hesitated, uncertain as to the right turning to take. He found himself helped out of his difficulty by the warder at the next gate, anxious to be off to his tea, summoning him to come along sharp and not keep him waiting there all night. 
the chaff and the humorous sallies to which he was subjected, and to which, of course, he had to provide prompt and effective reply, formed indeed his chief danger. For Toad was an animal with a strong sense of his own dignity, and the chaff was mostly, he thought, poor and clumsy, and the humor of the sallies entirely lacking. However, he kept his temper, though with great difficulty, suited his retorts of his company and his supposed character, and did his best not to overstep the limits of good taste. <laughs> Cross-dressing. Men cohabitating. I like this book. It's got some diversity in it. <laughs> it seemed hours before he crossed the last courtyard, rejecting the pressing invitations from the last guard room, and dodged the outspread arms of the last warder, pleading with simulated passion for just one farewell embrace. But at last he heard the wicket gate in the great outer door click behind him, felt the fresh air of the outer world upon his anxious brow, and knew that he was free. Dizzy with the easy success of his daring exploit, he walked quickly toward the lights of the town, not knowing in the least what he should do next, only quite certain of one thing that he must remove himself as quickly as possible from the neighborhood where the lady was forced to repent. He was forced to represent with so well-known and so popular a character. Well, probably a good idea, I guess. As he walked along, considering his attention was caught by some red and green lights a little way off to one side of the town, and the sound of puffing and snorting of engines and banging of shunted trucks fell on his ear. Uh-huh! He thought, this is a great piece of luck. A railway station is the thing I want most in the whole world at this moment. And what's more, I needn't go through town to get it. And shan't have to support this humiliating character by repartees which, thoroughly effective, do not assist one's sense of self-respect. Oh, Toad, you don't need more self-respect. You, you clearly got... Far more self-esteem than you're entitled to as things stand. He made his way to the train station accordingly, consulted a timetable and found that a train, bound more or less in the direction of his home, was due to start in half an hour. More luck, said Toad, his spirits rising rapidly, and went off to booking office to buy his ticket. He gave the name of the station that he knew to be the nearest to the French village, to the village of which Toad Hall was the principal feature and mechanically put his fingers in search of the necessary money, where his waistcoat pocket should have been. But here the cotton gown, which had nobly stood by him so far, and which he had basely forgotten, intervened and frustrated his efforts. In a sort of nightmare, he struggled with the strange, uncanny thing that seemed to hold in his hands, turn all muscular strivings to water, and laugh at him all at the time while other travellers, forming up a queue behind him, waited with impatience, making suggestions of more or less value and comments of how... Of, and comments of more or less stringency in point. At last, somehow, he never rightly understood how, he burst the barriers, attained the goal, arrived at where all Waste Coast pockets are eternally situated, and found not only no money, but no pocket to hold it, and no waistcoat to hold the pocket. To his horror, he recollected that he had both coat and waistcoat left behind him in his cell, and with them his pocketbook, money, keys, watch, matches, pencil case, all that makes life worth living, all that distinguishes the many-pocketed animal, the lord of creation, from the inferior one-pocketed or no-pocketed productions that hop up or trip about permissibly, unequipped for the real contest. Toad has discovered... The terror that is dresses without pockets. I thank you to the author. <laughs> In his misery, he made one desperate effort to carry the thing off, and with a return to his fine old manner, a blend of the squire and the college dawn, he said, Look here, I find I've left my purse behind. Just give me the ticket, and will you, and I'll send the money on tomorrow. I'm well known in these parts. The clerk stared at him in the rusty black bonnet a moment and then laughed. I should think you were pretty well known in these parts if you've tried this game often. Here, stand away from the windows, please, madam. You're obstructing the other passengers. 
an old gentleman who had been prodding him in the back for some moments here thrust him away and what was worse addressed him as good woman which angered toad more than anything that had occurred that evening Baffled and full of despair, he wandered blindly down the platform when the train was standing, and tears trickled down the side of his nose. It was hard, he thought, to be within sight of safety and almost home, and to be balked by the want of a few wretched shillings, and by the pettifogging mistrustfulness of paid officials. Very soon his escape would be discovered, the hunt would be up, he would be caught, reviled, loaded with chains, dragged back again to prison in bread and water and straw, his guards and penalties would be doubled, and oh, what sarcastic remarks the girl would make. What was to be done? He was not swift of foot, his figure was unfortunately recognizable. Could he not squeeze under the seat of a carriage? He had seen this method adopted by schoolboys when the journey money provided by thoughtful parents had been diverted to other and better ends. As he pondered, he found himself opposite the engine, which was being oiled, wiped, and generally caressed by its affectionate driver, a burly man with an oil can in one hand and a lump of cotton waste in the other. Hello, mother, said the engine driver. What's the trouble? You don't look particularly cheerful. Oh, sir, cried Toad afresh. I am a poor and happy washerwoman and have lost all my money and can't pay for a ticket. And I must get home tonight somehow, and wherever I am to do, I don't know. Oh dear, oh dear. Did I just lose tracking? What happened there? Hmm. Wireless is still on. My apologies. Um, I seem to have lost my VTuber tracking. Um, hmm. Well, I guess we can try restarting it. Less than an hour in, though. Alright. Seems we've got my tracking back, so we'll call it good there. Um, if I can get lined up properly in the scene. Ah, <laughs> uh, thank you all for bearing with me through the scuff. I am told that scuff makes for a professional uh, streamer, so I suppose I'm delighted to join the ranks. That's bad business indeed, said the engine driver reflectively. Lost your money and can't get home. And got some kids too waiting for you, I dare say. Any amount of them, <laughs> sobbed Toad. And they'll be hungry and playing matches and upsetting lamps and little innocents and quarreling and going on generally. Oh dear, oh dear. Upsetting lamps and playing with matches. What the heck did Toad get into as a kid? I'll tell you what I'll do, said the good engine driver. You're a washerwoman to your trade, says you. Well, that's all. That's that. And I'm an engine driver, and as you wait, well, well may see, there's no denying it's terribly dirty work. Uses up the power of shirts it does till my missus is fair tired of washing them. If you'll wash a few shirts for me when you get home and send them along, I'll give you a ride on my engine. It's against the company policy, but we're not so particular in this out of the way parts. The toad's misery turned into rapture as he eagerly scrambled up into the cab of the engine. Of course, he had never washed a shirt in his life, and couldn't if he tried, and anyhow he wasn't going to begin. But he thought, When I get safely home to Toad Hall, and have money again and pockets to put it in, I will send the engine driver enough to pay for quite a quantity of washing. That will be the same thing or better. The guard waved his welcome flag, the engine driver whistled in cheerful response, and the train moved out of the station. As the speed increased and the toad could see on either side of him real fields and trees and hedges and cows and horses all flying past him, and as he thought how every minute was bringing him nearer to Toad Hall and sympathetic friends and money to chink in his pocket, and then a soft bed to sleep in and good things to eat and praise and admiration of the recital of his adventures and his surpassing cleverness, he began to skip up and down and shout and sing snatches of song. To the great astonishment of the engine driver who had come across washerwomen before, at long intervals, 
but never want it all like this. They had covered many miles, and Toad was already considering what he would have for supper as soon as he got home, when he noticed that the engine driver, with a puzzled expression on his face, was leaning over the side of the engine and listening hard. Then he saw him climb on the coals and graze over the top of the train. Then he returned and said to Toad, It's very strange with last train, ru train running in this direction tonight. Yeah, I could swore I heard another one following us. Toad ceased his frivolous antics at once. He became grave and depressed. The dull pain in the lower part of his spine communicating itself to his legs made him want to sit down and try desperately not to think of all the possibilities. By this time, the moon was shining brightly and the engine driver, steadying himself on the coal, could command a view of the line behind them for a long distance. Presently, he called out, I can see it now. It is an engine on our trails coming along at great pace. Looks as if we were being pursued. The miserable toad, crouching in the coal dust, tried hard to think of something to do with dismal want of success. They're gaining on us fast, cried the engine driver, and the engine is crowded with the queerest lot of people. Men like ancient warders, waving halberds, policemen in their helmets, waving truncheons, and shabbily dressed men in pot hats oblivious to the unmistakable plainclothes detective, even at distance, waving revolvers and walking sticks, all waving and shouting the same thing. Stop, stop, stop! And Toad fell on his knees among the coals, and raising clasped paws in supplication, cried, Save me, only save me, kind dear engine driver, and I will confess everything. I am not the simple washerwoman I seem to be. I have no children waiting for me, innocent or otherwise. I am a toad, a well-known and popular Mr. Toad, a landed proprietor. I have just escaped by my great daring and cleverness from a loathsome dungeon into which my enemies have flung me. And if those fellows on that engine recapture me, it will be chains and bread and water and straw and misery once more for poor, unhappy, innocent toad. The engine driver looked down upon him very sternly and said, Now tell the truth, what were you in prison for? It was nothing very much, the poor toad, coloring deeply. I only borrowed a motor car while the owners were at lunch. They had no need of it at the time. They didn't mean to steal it, really, but people, especially magistrates, take such harsh views of thoughtless and mean and high-spirited actions. The engine driver looked very grave and said, I fear that you have indeed a wicked toad, and by rights I ought to give you up to be offered to justice. But you are evidently in sore trouble and distress, so I will not desert you. I don't hold with motor cars for one thing, and I don't hold with being ordered by policemen when I'm on my own engine for another. And the sight of an animal in tears always makes me feel queer and soft-hearted, so cheer up, toad. I'll do my best. Then we may beat them yet. <laughs> I have given this man entirely the wrong accent, and I'll be changing that presently. They piled on more coals, shoveling furiously. The furnace roared, the sparks flew, the engine leapt and swung, but still the pursuers slowly gained. The engine driver, with a sigh, wiped his brow with a handful of cotton waste and said, I'm afraid it's no good, Toad. You see, they are running light, and they have the better engine. It's just one thing left for us to do, and it's your only chance, so attend very carefully to what I tell you. A short way ahead of us is a long tunnel, and on the other side of that line passes through a thick wood. Now I will put all speed I can while we are running through the tunnel, but the other fellas will slow down a bit naturally for fear of an accident. When we are through, I will shut off steam and put on brakes as hard as I can, and the moment when it's safe to do so, you must jump and hide in the wood before they can get through the tunnel and see you. Then I will go full speed ahead again, and they can chase me if they like for as long as they like, and as far as they like. Now mind me and be ready to jump when I tell you. They piled on more coals, and the train shot into the tunnel, and the engine rushed and roared and rattled, till at last they shot out the other end into fresh air and the peaceful moonlight, and they saw the wood lying dark and helpful upon either side of the line. The driver shut off steam and put on brakes. The toad got down on the step, and as the train slowed down to almost a walking pace, he heard the driver call out, Nah, jump! The toad jumped, rolled down a short embankment, picked himself up unhurt, scrambled into the wood, and hid. Peeping out, he saw his train get up speed again and disappear at a great pace. 
Then out of the tunnel burst the pursuing engine, roaring and whistling with her motley crew, waving their various weapons, shouting, Stop! 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 When they were passed, the toad had a hearty laugh for the first time since he was thrown into prison. But he soon stopped laughing when he came to consider that it was now very late, and dark, and cold, and he was in an unknown wood with no money and no chance of supper, and still far from the friends and home. And the dead silence of everything after the roar and rattle of the train was something of a shock. He dared not leave the shelter of the trees, so he stuck into the wood with the idea of leaving the railway as far behind him as possible. Oh, was there a bad echo from that, Naruto? Well, that's good to know, thank you. I'll have to see what I can do about it. I normally talk fairly quietly, and I think that might help with the echo somewhat at least, but, uh, no. There's also only so much I can ever do. After so many weeks within the walls, um, yes, I'm, <laughs> okay, so to explain a little bit, I do stream from inside of my bedroom, um, but my bedroom itself is a fairly bare affair. Um, because I've spent so much time homeless and so much time on the road, I don't have a lot that I can use to fill a room. So while I try to um, you know, collect things that can be used for sound dampening and uh, decoration and things of that nature, um, there, there's very little I can actually do to reduce the echo more than I already do. Um, I did, however, manage to hang up a couple of shower curtains uh, the cloth variety seemed to dampen the sound quite a bit, and that helps. So, <laughs> if I could afford proper soundproofing, I would absolutely use it, Naruto. Um, unfortunately, though, it's not going to be in the cards anytime soon. <laughs> After so many weeks within walls, he found the strange wood an unfriendly and inclined he thought to make fun of him. Night jars, sounding the mechanical rattle, made him think the wood was full of searching warders closing in on him. Um, no, I, I don't have a throne. Um, I also haven't set up a donation link at this time. Um, I suppose I can do that before my next stream. It wouldn't hurt anything. Um, but no, at, at this time I'm simply set up to share stories. I... I don't have a way for uh, people to reach out. <laughs> I'll do what I can, Naruto. <laughs> hmm. Nightjar, sounding in the mechanical rattle, made him think the wood was full of searching warders closing in on him. An owl, swooping noiselessly toward him, brushed his shoulder with its wing, making him jump with a horrid certainty that it was a hand, then flitted off, moth-like, laughing its low... Which Toad thought was in very poor taste. Once he met a fox who stopped, looked him up and down in a sarcastic sort of way, and said, Hello, washerwoman. Half a pair of socks in a pillowcase shot this week. Mine doesn't occur again. And swaggered off sniggering. Toad looked about for a stone to throw at him, but could not succeed in finding one, which vexed him more than anything. At last, cold and hungry and tired out, he sought the shelter of a hollow tree, where with branches and dead leaves he made himself as comfortable a bed as he could, and slept soundly toward morning. Oh, quite the little adventure there. Ironically enough, though, that little episode would be enough to get the book banned in several places. You're not wrong, Naruto, and I do need to set that up sooner than later. Um, switching from being a software developer to a social worker has also cut into my finances rather dramatically. But the work itself is something that I can feel proud of, and it's something that I feel is important. Um, so, in the meanwhile, I will continue telling my stories, and yes, I'll... Once I've wrapped a few things up here tonight, I'll see what I can do about setting something up so that people who have good intentions or appreciations are welcome to provide some additional uh, food on my table, really. <laughs> Chapter 9, Wayfarer's All The water rat was restless, 
and he did not exactly know why. To all appearance, the summer's pomp was still at fullest height, and although the tilled acres, green, had given way to gold, the rowans were reddening and the woods were dashed here and there with a tawny fierceness, yet light and warmth and colour were still present in undiminished measure, queen of any chilly premonitions of the passing year. But the constant course of the orchards and hedges had shrunk to a casual even song of a few yet unwearied performers. The robin was beginning to assert himself once more, and there was a feeling in the air of change and departure. The cuckoo, of course, had long been silent, but many another feathered friend, for months apart the familiar landscape and its small society, was missing too, and it seemed that the ranks thinned steadily day by day. Rat, ever observant of all winged movements, saw that it was taking daily a southing tendency, and even as he lay in bed at night he thought he could make out, passing in the darkness overhead, the beat and quiver of impatient pinions, obedient to the peremptory call. Nature's grand hotel has its season, like the others. As the guests one by one pack and pay and depart, and the seats at the table d'hôte shrink pitifully at each succeeding meal, as suites of rooms are closed, carpets taken up, and waiters sent away, those boarders who are staying on and pension, until the next year's full reopening cannot help being somewhat affected by all the splittings and farewells, this eager discussion of plans, routes, and fresh quarters, the daily shrinkage in the stream of comradeship. One gets unsettled, depressed, and inclined to be querulous. Why this craving for change? Why not stay on quietly here like us and be jolly? You don't know this hotel out of the season, and what fun we have amongst ourselves, we fellows who remain, see the whole year interesting year out well very true no doubt the others reply we quite envy you and some other year perhaps but just now we have engagements and there's the bus at the door our time is up so they depart with a smile and a nod and we miss them and feel resentful the rat was a self-sufficing sort of animal rooted to the land and whomever and whoever went he stayed still he could not help noticing what was in the air and feeling some of its influence in his bones Hmm. Voice acting commissions might be an interesting idea as well, Naruto. I don't dislike the idea. Is there a particular place you would recommend that I do them? It was difficult to settle down anything seriously, with all this flitting going on. Leaving the waterside, where the rushes stood thick and tall in a stream that was becoming sluggish and slow, he wandered country words crossed a field or two of pasturage already looking dusty and parched, and thrust into the great sea of wheat, yellow, wavy and murmurous, full of quiet motion and small whisperings. Here he often loved to wander, through the forest of stiff, strong stalks that carried their own golden sky away over his head, a sky that was always dancing, shimmering, softly talking, or swaying strongly to the passing wind and recovering itself with a toss and a merry laugh. Here, too, he had many small friends, a society complete in itself, leading full and busy lives. Here, too, he had many small um, but always with a spare moment to gossip and exchange news with the visitor. Today, however, though they were civil enough, the field mice and harvest mice seemed preoccupied. Many were digging and tunneling busily. Others, gathered together in small groups, examined plans and drawings of small flats, stated to be desirable and compact and situated conveniently near the stores. Some were hauling on dusty trunks and dress baskets, others were already elbow deep packing their belongings, while everywhere piles and bundles of wheat, oats, barley, beech mast, and nuts lay about and ready for transport. Do I have restrictions on what I would voice? Um... There are some very specific things that I would probably not voice. Um, they are primarily things that are explicitly blasphemous. Um, it, there's some things that are particularly cruel or unkind uh, in ways that are absolutely unwarranted. You will not find me reading Mein Kampf on stream, period. Um, but... I mean, I do have a variety of voices that I use to varying effect. And if you've seen me on Lexi's stream or on Road's stream, you'll know that I 
do have a few different uh, things that I pull out when I'm not, uh, well, reading stories. Um, and to that effect... Let's give a shout out to Lexi here. Um, Lexi is one of the people who I have streamed with in the past. Um, she is somebody who I'm quite fond of and whose content is 18 plus, but in a very encouraging and enthusiastic sort of way. People are welcome within her community and it's something that has helped me in some ways to keep my own stability as I've gone through a lot of life changes in the previous couple of years. So I'm quite grateful to her. And if you have a chance to follow her, um, much of her uh, streams are either video games or her doing artwork. Um, her art jams on many Wednesday nights are particularly fun, um, but she has a lovely community and it's a grand time all around. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, Naruto, but I certainly hope it gives you some idea of what my limitations would be. Um, and from there, I suppose we may as well carry on. Here's old Raddy! They cried as soon as they saw him. Come here and bear a hand, Rad, and don't stand about idle. What sort of games are you up to? said the rat severely. You know it isn't time to be thinking of winter quarters yet, by a long way. Oh yes, we know that, explained a field mouse rather shamefacedly. But it's always as well to be in good time, isn't it? We really must get all the furniture and baggage and stores moved out of this before those horrid machines begin clinking around the fields. And then, you know, the best flats get picked up so quickly nowadays. And if you're late, you have to put up with anything. And they want such a lot of doing up, too, before they're fit to move into. Of course, we're early, if we know that. But we're only just making a start. A bother starts, said the rat. It's a splendid day. Come for a row, or stroll along the hedges, or picnic in the woods or something. Well, I, I think not today, thank you, replied the mouse hurriedly. Perhaps some other day. When we've more time. The rat, with a snort of contempt, swung round to go, tripped over a hat box, and fell with undignified remarks. <laughs> Hello, Rage. Yes, nice little head pats for you, dearie. If people would be more careful, said a field mouse rather stiffly, and look where they're going, people wouldn't hurt themselves and forget themselves. Mind that hold all, rat! You'd better sit down somewhere. In an hour or two, we may be more free to attend to you. You won't be free, as you call it. Much the side of Christmas, I can say that, retorted the rat grumpily as he picked his way out of the field. He returned somewhat despondently to his river again. His faithful, steady-going old river, which never packed up, flitted, or went into winter quarters. In the osiers, which fringed the bank, he spied a shallow... A uh, swallow sitting. Presently it was joined by another, and then a third, and the birds, fidgeting restlessly on their bow, talked together earnestly and low. <laughs> I'm glad you're finding a comfy lap to sit on, Rage. Um, I will have to take uh, note of those a little later on here, Naruto, but thank you. In fact, I may just uh, capture that real quick. Alright. I'll attend to those a little later on. Thank you for the suggestions. I really do appreciate it. What, already? said the rat, strolling up to them. What's the hay? I call it simply ridiculous. Oh, we are not off yet, if that's what you mean, replied the first swallow. We're only making plans and arranging things, talking it over, you know. What route we're taking this year and where we're stopping, so on, that's half the fun. Fun, said the rat. Now that's just what I don't understand. If you've got to leave this pleasant place, then your friends who will miss you and your smug homes that you've just settled into, what, 
the, when the hour strikes, I've no doubt you go bravely and face all the trouble and discomfort and change in newness and make believe that you're not very unhappy. But I want to talk about, but to want to talk about it or even to think about it till you really need. <laughs> I would appreciate that as well, Naruto. But to want to talk about it or think about it till you really need. No, you don't understand that, surely, said the second swallow. First, we feel it staring within us as sweet and rest. Then back come the recollections one by one, like homing pigeons. They flutter through our dreams at night. They fly with us in our wings and circlings by day. We hunger to inquire of each other, to compare notes and assure ourselves that it is already true. As one by one the scents and sounds and names flung for a forgotten places come gradually back and back into us. Couldn't you stop on for just this year? Suggested the water brat wistfully. We've all got to do our best to make you feel at home. You know I do what good times we have here while you're far away. Well, welcome back, Lexi. I hope you had a very refreshing nap. I tried stopping on one. I tried stopping on one year, said the third swallow. I had grown so fond of the place that when the time came... I hung back and let the others go on without me. For a few weeks it was all well enough, but afterwards, off the weary length of the night, the shivering, the sunless days, the air so clammy and chill, and not an insect in an acre of naught was no good. My courage broke down, and one cold stormy night I took wing flying well inland on account of the strong easterly gales that were snowing as hard as I beat through the passes of the great mountains, and I had a stiff fight to win through. But never shall I forget the blissful feeling of the hot sun again on my back as I spread down the, the lakes that lay so blue and placid below me, and the taste of my first bath insect. The past was like a bad dream. The future was all happy holiday as I moved southward, week by week, easily, lazily, lingering as long as I dared, but always heeding the call. No, I had my warning. Never again did I think of disobedience. That's a mystery. Oh, it sounds like the counts. Ah, ah, ah. I am the disobedient swallow. Perhaps, or perhaps, I shall start to count. One. Ah, ah, ah. Two. Ah, ah, ah. Three. Three attempts at making a joke. Ah, ah, ah. Hello, Capri. Welcome to the stream. It's good to see you. I'm always delighted you're here. Ah, yes, the call of the south, of the south, twittered the other two dreamily. Its songs, its hues, its radiant arrow, don't you remember? And forgetting the rat, they slid into passionate remembrance while he fasten listened fascinated, and his heart burned within him. In himself, too, he knew there was, it was vibrating at last. The cord hitherto dormant and unsuspected. The mere chatter of these southern bound birds, their pale and through and through with it, what would one moment be a real thing work in him? One passionate touch of the real southern sun, one waft of the authentic odor. With closed eyes, he dared to dream a moment in full abandonment, and when he looked again, the river seemed steely and chill, the green fields gray and lightless. Then his loyal heart seemed to cry out on his weaker self for its treachery. <laughs> Comedy works in rules of three. You're not wrong, Lexi. Not only that, but the rule of three is something that's actually commonly seen in uh, multiple varieties of worship. It's a number that shows up in multiple cultures and contexts, and it's also quite often found in fairy tales and fables. Um, three, two, five, and seven, oddly enough, odd, uh, tend to show up very frequently when there's something that you're trying to have in completeness or in a series. Why do you ever come back for then at all? He demanded of the swallows jealously. What do you find to attract you to this poor, drab little country? Video game bosses worked in rules of three. 
Until you have to hit them eight times, I suppose. And what and do you think, the first swallow said, that the call is, other call is not for us too in its due season? The call of lush meadow grass, wet orchards, warm insect hunting ponds, of browsing cattle, of haymaking, and all the farm buildings clustering round the house of perfect ease? Do you suppose, said the second one, that you are the only living thing that craves a hungry longing to hear the cuckoo's note again? <laughs> Miss Sasslass? Hmm, there's a new one. I seem to be picking up new names every day recently. <laughs> Miss Fairytale, Owl, Owl Mom, Miss Sasslass? <laughs> Silly. In due time, said the third, we shall be homesick once more for the quiet water lilies swaying on the surface of the English stream. But today the light seems pale and thin and very far away. Just now our blood dances to other music. They fell a twittering amongst themselves once more, and this time their intoxicating babble was of violet seas, tawny sands, and lizard haunted walls. Can't really call me Owl later. Lady, you're not wrong. I mean, you strictly could, but it would give a very different impression. But the people from last stream started calling me Owl Mom, and I have a hard time disliking that one. It's very cute. Restlessly, the rat wandered off once more, climbed the slope that rose gently from the north bank of the river, and lay looking out toward the great ring of downs that barred his vision further southward. His simple horizon hither too, his mountains of the moon, his limit behind which lay nothing he had caught, cared to see or know. Today, to him gazing south with a newborn's need stirring in his heart, the clear sky over their long low outline seemed to pulsate with promise. Today, the unseen was everything, the unknown the only real fact of life. On this side of the hills was now the real blank. On the other lay the crowded and coloured panorama that his inner eye was seeing so clearly. What seas lay beyond, green, leaping, and crested? What sunbathed coasts along the white villas glittered against olive wood? What quiet harbours thronged with gallant shipping bound for purple islands of wine and spice? Islands set low in languorous waters. Owl witch? <laughs> I see you have a very specific way of referring to me. <laughs> Well, that's all right. He rose and descended river wards once more, then changed his mind and sought the side of the dusty lane. There, lying half buried in the thick, cool underhedge tangle that bordered it, he could muse on the metalled road and all the wondrous world that it led up to, on all the wayfarers too that might have trodden it, and the fortunes and adventures they had gone to seek or found unseeking, out there, beyond, beyond! Footsteps fell on his ear, and the figure of one that walked somewhat wearily came into view, and he saw that it was a rat, and a very dusty one. The wayfarer, as he reached him, saluted with a gesture of courtesy that had something foreign about it, hesitated a moment, then with a pleasant smile turned from the track and sat down by his side in the cool herbage. He seemed tired, and the rat let him rest unquestioned, understanding something of what was in his thoughts knowing, too, the value all animals attach at times to mere silent companionship when the weary muscles slacken and the mind marks time. The wayfarer was lean and keen-featured and somewhat bowed at the shoulders. His paws were thin and long, his eyes much wrinkled at the corners, and he wore small gold earrings in his neatly set, well-shaped ears. His knitted jersey was of a faded blue, his breeches, patched and stained, were based on a blue foundation and his small belongings that he carried were tied up in a blue cotton handkerchief. Hmm. I'm sorry you think so of me, Naruto. It really isn't a very nice way to refer to someone, but, well, I suppose people do what they do. When he had rested a while, the stranger sighed, snuffed the air, and looked about him. That was a clover, that warm whiff on the breeze, he remarked. And those are cows, 
We are cropping the grass behind us and blowing softly between mouthfuls. There is a sound of distant reapers, and yonder rises a blue line of cottage smoke against the woodland. The river runs somewhere close by, for I hear the call of a moorhen, and I see by your bid that you are freshwater mariner. Everything seems asleep and yet going on all the time. It is a goodly life that you lead, my friend. No doubt the best in the world, if only you are strong enough to lead it. Oh yes, it's the life. The only life to live, responded the water rat dreamily, and without his usual wholehearted conviction. I did not say exactly that, replied the stranger cautiously. But no doubt, it's the best I've tried it, and I know. And because I've just tried it, six months of it, and know it's the best, here I am, foot sore and hungry, tramping away from it, tramping southwards, following the old call back to the old life, the life which is mine and which will not let me go. Is this then yet another of them? Where have you just come from? He asked. He hardly dared to ask where he was bound for. He seemed to know the answer only too well. Nice little farm, replied the wayfarer briefly. Up along in that direction, he nodded northward. Never mind about it. I had everything I could want. Everything I had any right to expect of life and more, and here I am. Glad to be here all the same, though. Glad to be here. So many miles further on the road. So many hours nearer to my heart's desire. His shining eyes held fast to the horizon, and he seemed to be listening for some sound that was wanting from the inland acreage, vocal as it was with the cheerful music of pasturage and farmland. You're not one of us, said the water rat, nor yet a farmer, nor even I should judge of this country. Right, I'm a seafaring rat, I am, and the port I originally hailed from is Constantinople, though I'm a sort of foreigner there too. In a manner of speaking. You will have heard of Constantinople, friend. A fair city, and an ancient and glorious one. And while you may have heard, too, of Sigurd, king of Norway, and how he sailed th thither with sixty ships, and how he and his men rode up through the streets, while canopied in their honour with purple and gold, and how the emperor and empress came down, banqueted with him on his board his ship. When Sigurd returned home, many of the northern men remained and entered the emperor's bodyguard, and my ancestor, Norwegian-born, stayed behind too, with the ships that Sigurd gave the Emperor. Seafarers have we have ever been, and no wonder, as for me, the city of my birth is no more than my home than any pleasant port between here and there and London River. I know them all, and they know me, sit down on any of their quay keys or foreshores, and I am home again. I am, in fact, having fun reading, Caffrey. Thank you for asking. I suppose you go to great voyages, said the water rat with growing interest. Months and months out of sight of the land, and provisions running short, and allowances to water, and your mind communing with the mighty ocean, all that sort of thing. By no means, said the sea rat frankly. Such a life as you describe would not suit me at all. I am in the coasting trade, and I am rarely out of sight of land. It's the jolly times on the shore that appeal to me as much as any seafaring. Oh, the southern seaports, the smell of them, writing lights at night, the glamour. Banning books makes people want to read them more? Mm, you're not wrong. But it also makes it very hard to come across books. At the same time, I had a devil of a time finding a copy of Journey to the West, and only just recently managed to come across one myself, after years of looking. Banning books does a solid job of getting rid of them in the public eye, and in the eyes of those with a mind to stay in some particular code of fashion. But, unfortunately, some of those are the people that we need to convince that these bans are unjust. So, it becomes its own problem. Uh, perhaps you've chosen a better way said the water rat, but rather doubtfully. Tell me something of your coasting, then, if you have a mind to. And what sort of harvest an animal of spring might hope to bring home with it to warm his latter days with gaunt memories by the fireside? For my life, I confess to you, feels to me more today somewhat now circumscribed. 
<laughs> you're not wrong, Naruto. And further complicating matters is that the English translations of the book are all within the last 60 years, which places them well within US copyrights. I can't get a public domain translation of it for another 30 years, minimum. My last voyage, began the sea rat, but landed me eventually in this country, bound with high hopes for my inland farm, will serve as a good example of any of them and indeed with, as an epitome of my highly coloured life. Family troubles as usual began it. The domestic storm cone was hoisted and I shipped myself on board with a small trading vessel bound from Constantinople. My classic seas, who were every wave throbs with a deathless memory, to the Grecian islands in the Levant. Those were golden days and balmy nights, in and out of harbour all the time. Old friends everywhere, sleeping in some cool temple or ruined cistern during the heat of day, the feasting and song after sundown under great stars set in a velvet sky. Thence we returned and coasted up the Adriatic, shores swimming in an atmosphere of amber, rose and aquamarine. We lay in the wide ha landlocked harbours. We roamed through ancient and noble cities until at last one morning as the sun rose royally behind us, we rode into Venice down a path of gold. Oh, Venice is a fine city, wherein a rat can wander as ease and take his pleasure. Or oh, when weary want for wandering, one can sit at the edge of a grand canal at night, feasting with his friends, and the air is full of music and the sky full of stars, and the lights and flashing shimmer of polished steel prows, and the swaying of gondolas packed. You could well walk across the canal from side to side, and then the food. Do you like shellfish? Well, well, we won't linger any longer on that now. Oh, hello, uni, uh, uni ACH corn. I feel like I know you from somewhere, but it's delightful that you've chosen to drop by. Oh, is it Uni's birthday? And please don't eat members of my chat without consent. It, it's generally bad form. Uni is from Elisa's server. Okay, so that's where I know them from. And yes, it is your birthday. Oh, well, hold on just a second then. <clears throat> Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Uni, happy birthday to you. I can't always do much. If somebody has a birthday that they want celebrated, I'm more than happy to give them a song on it. Just let me know. <laughs> he was silent for a time, and the water rat, silent too and enthralled, floated on dream canals and heard a phantom song peeling high between vapors, grey wave lapped walls. <laughs> Sil southwards we sailed again at last, continued the sea rat coasting down the Italian shore till finally we made Palmero, and there I quitted for a long happy spell on shore. I never stick around too long to one ship, one gets narrow-minded and prejudiced. Besides, Sicily is one of my happy hunting grounds. I know everyone there, and their ways just suit me. I spent many jolly weeks in the island, staying with friends up country. When I grew restless again, I took advantage of a ship that was trading to Sardinia and Corsica, and very glad was I to feel the fresh breeze and the sea spray in my face once more. But isn't it very hot and stuffy down there in the holds, I think you call it? Asked the water rat. The seafarer looked at him with suspicion of a wink. I'm an old hand, he remarked with much simplicity. Captain's cabin is good enough for me. Oh, it's a hard life by all accounts, murmured the rat, sunk deep in thought. For the crew it is replied the seafarer gravely, again with the ghost of a wink. From Corsica, he went on, I made use of a ship that was taking wine to the mainland. We made a lasio in the evening, lay to, hauled up our wine casks and hove them overboard, tied one to the other by a long line, and the crew took the boats and rowed shorewards, singing as they went, and drawing after them the long bobbing procession of casks like a mile of porpoises. On the sands they had horses waiting, 
which dragged the casks up from steep street of the town that a fine Russian clatter and scramble. When the last cask was in, we went and refreshed and rested, and sat late into the night, drinking with our friends. And the next morning I took the great olive woods for a spell and rest. But now I had done with the islands for the time, and pots and shipping were plentiful. So I led a lazy life among the peasants, lying and watching them work, or stretched out on high hillside with the blue Mediterranean far below me. And so at length, by easy stages and partly on foot, partly by sea to Marseille, and the meeting of old shipmates, and the visiting of some great ocean-bound vessels, and feasting once more. Fuck of shellfish! Why, sometimes I dream of shellfish of Marseille, and wake up crying. Oh, the sea rat and the river rat. Oh, that reminds me, said the polite water rat. You happened to mention you were hungry and out to have spoken earlier. Of course you will stop and take your midday meal with me. The hall's close by. It is some time past noon and you are very welcome to whatever there is. Oh, I call you that kind and brotherly of you. I was indeed hungry when I sat down. And ever since I have inadvertently happened to mention shellfish, my pangs become extreme. But couldn't you fetch it along out here? I am none too fond of going under hatches unless I'm obliged to. And then, while we eat, I can tell you more of my, concerning my voyages and the pleasant life I lead. At least it is very pleasant to me, and by your attention I judge it commends itself to you. Whereas if we go indoors, it is a hundreds to one that I shall presently fall asleep. Well, that is indeed an excellent suggestion, said the water rat and hurried off home. There he got out the luncheon basket and packed a simple meal, in which, remembering the stranger's origin and preferences, he took care to include a yard of long French bread, a sausage out of which the garlic sang, some cheese which lay down and cried, and a long-necked straw-covered flask, wherein lay bottled sunshine shed and garnered on the far southern slopes. Thus laden, he returned with all speed and blushed for pleasure at the old seaman's commendation of his taste and judgment, as together they unpacked the basket and laid out the contents in the grass by the roadside. Hmm. The sea rat, as soon as his hunger was somewhat assuaged, continued the history of his latest voyage. Conducting his simple hearer from port to port of Spain, landing him at Lisbon, Oporto, and Bordeaux, introducing him to the pleasant harbours of Cornwall and Devon, and so up the channel to that final quayside, where after landing, where landing after winds long contrary, storm driven and weather beaten, he had caught the first magical hints and heraldings of another spring, and fired by these, had sped along, a, had sped on a long tramp inland. Hungry for the experiment of life on some quiet farmstead very far from the weary beating of any sea. Spellbound and quivering with excitement, the water rat followed the adventurer league by league, over stormy bays, through crowded roadsteads, across harbour bars on a racing tide, up winding rivers that hit busy little towns around a sudden turn, and left him with a regretful sigh planted at his dull inland farm about which he desired to hear nothing. By this time their meal was over and the seafarer, refreshed and strengthened, his voice more, more vibrant, his eye lit with a brightness that seemed caught from faraway sea beacons, filled his glass with red and glowing vintage of the south, and leaning toward the water rat, compelled his gaze and held him, body and soul, while he talked. Those eyes were of the changing foam-streaked green of leaping northern seas, and the glass shone hot ruby that seemed the very heart of the south, beating for him who had courage to respond to its pulsation. The twin lights, the shifting gray and the steadfast red, mastered the water rat and held him bound, fascinated, powerless. The quiet world outside their rays receded far away and ceased to be, and the talk, the wonderful talk, flowed on. Or was it speech entirely? Or did it pass at times into song, the shanty of the sailors weighing on the dripping anchor, the sonorous hum of the shrouds in a tearing northeaster, ballad of the fisherman hauling his nets at sundown against an apricot sky, chords of guitar and mandolin from gondola or caic, 
did it change into the cry of the wind, plaintive at first, angrily shrill as it freshened, rising to a tearing, whistling, sinking to a musical trickle of air from the reach of a bellying sail. All these sounds the spellbound listener seemed to hear, and with them the hungry complaint of the gulls and the sea mews, the soft thunder of the breaking wave, the cry of the protesting shingle. Back into speech again it passed, and with beating heart he was following the adventures of a dozen seaports, the fights, the escapes, the rallies, the comradeships, the gallant undertakings, for he searched islands for treasure, fished in still lagoons and doze, day long on warm white sand. Of deep sea fishings he heard tell, and mighty silver gatherings of mile long net, of sudden perils, noise of breakers on a moonless night, or the tall bows of a great liner taking shape overhead through the fog. Of the merry homecoming, the headland rounded, the harbor lights opened out, the groups seen dimly on the quay, the cheery hail, the splash of the hawser, the trudge of the steep little street toward the comfortings of low red curtained windows. Lastly, in his waking dream, it seemed to him that the adventurer had risen to his feet, but was still speaking, still holding him fast with his sea-gray eyes. And now, he said softly talk, saying, he was softly saying, I take to the road again, holding to the southwards for many a long and dusty day, so that last I reach the little grey sea known, a uh, town I know so well, that clings to along one side of the steep harbour. There through the dark doorways you down flights of lone steps, overhung by green Great pink tufts of valerian, and ending in a patch of sparkling blue water. The little boats that lie tethered to the rings and stanchions of the old sea wall are gaily painted as those I clambered in and out of my own childhood. A salmon leap on the flood tide. Schools of mackerel flash and play past quayside and foreshore. And the windows great vessels glide, night and day, up to their moorings or forth to the open sea. There, sooner or later, the ships of all seafaring nations arrive, and there, at its destined hour, the ship of my choice will let go its anchor. I shall take my time, I shall tarry and bide, till at last the long right one lies waiting for me, warped out into stream, loaded low, a boar spirit pointing down harbour. I shall slip on board, by boat or by hawser, and by one morning I shall wake to the song and tramp of soldiers, the clink of her caps in, and the rattle of the anchor chain coming merrily in. We shall break out the jib and the foresail, and the white horse houses on the harbour side will glide slowly past us as she ste gather steering way, and the voyages will have begun. As she forges toward the she headland, she will clothe herself in canvas, and once outside, the sounding slap of great green seas as she heels to the wind, pointing south. And you, you will come too, young brother. For the days pass and never return, and the south still waits for you. Take the adventure. Heed the call. Now, ere the irrevocable moment passes, tis but a banging of the door behind you, a blithesome step forward, and you are out of the old life and into the new. And some day, some day long hence, jog home, and here if you will, when the cup has been drained and the play has been played, and sit down by your quiet river with your store of goodly memories of company. And easily overtake me on the road, for you are strong, and I am aging and go softly. I will linger and look back, and at last I will surely see you coming, eager and light-hearted, with all the south in your face. The voice died away and ceased as an insect's tiny trumpet dwindles swiftly into silence, and the water rat, paralyzed and staring, saw at last but a distant speck on the white surface of the road. Mechanically, he rose and proceeded to repack the luncheon basket, carefully and without haste. Mechanically, he returned home, gathered together a few small necessities and special treasures he was fond of, and put them in a satchel, acting with slow deliberation, moving about the room like a sleepwalker, listing ever with parted lips. He swung the satchel over his shoulder, carefully selected a stout stick for his wayfaring, and with no haste, but with no hesitation at all, he stepped across the threshold, just as Mole appeared at the door. Why, where are you off to, Ratty? 
asked the mole in great surprise, grasping him by the arm. Going south with the rest of them, muttered Rat in a dreamy monotone, never looking at him. Seawards first, and then on shipboard, and so to the shores that are calling me. He pressed resolutely forward, still without haste, but with dogged fixity of purpose. But the mole, now thoroughly alarmed, placed himself in front of him, and looking into his eyes, saw that they were glazed and set, and turned to street and shifting gray. Not his friend's eyes, but the eyes of some other animal. Grappling him with him strongly, he dragged him inside, threw him down, and held him. The rat struggled desperately for a few moments, and then his strength seemed suddenly to leave him, and he lay still and exhausted, with closed eyes, trembling. Presently, the mole assisted him to rise and placed him in a chair, where he sat collapsed and shrunken into himself, his body shaken by a violent shivering, passing in time into a hysterical fit of dry sobbing. The mole made the door fast, threw the satchel into a drawer and locked it, and sat down quietly on the table by his friend, waiting for the strange seizure to pass. Gradually, the rat sank into a troubled doze, broken by starts and confused murmurings of things strange and wild and foreign to the unenlightened. Mole, and from that he passed into a deep slumber. Very anxious in mind, the mole left him for a time and busied himself with household matters, and it was getting dark when it, he returned to the parlor and found the rat where he had left him, wide awake indeed, but listless silence and dejected he took one hasty glance at his eyes found them to his great gratification clear and dark and brown again as before and then sat down and tried to cheer him up and help him to relate what had happened to him poor ratty did his best and by degrees to explain things but how could he put into cold words what had mostly been suggestion how recall for another's benefit the haunting sea voices that had sung to him how reproduce, at second hand, the magic of the seafarer's hundred reminiscences? Even to himself, now the spell was broken and the glamour gone, he found it difficult to account for what had seemed, some hours ago, the inevitable and only thing. It is not surprising, then, that he failed to convey to the Mole any clear idea of what he had been through that day. To the Mole this much, much was plain. A fit or attack had passed away and left him sane again though shaken and cast down by the reaction. But he seemed to have lost all interest for the time being in things that went to make up his daily life, as well as in all pleasant forecastings of the altered days and doings and changing seasons surely to bring. Casually, then, and with seeming indifference, the mole turned his talk to the harvest that was being gathered in the towering wagons and their streaming teams, the growing ricks and the large moon rising over bare acres dotted with sheaves. He talked of the reddening apples around, of the browning nuts, of jams and preserves, and the distilling of cordials, till by easy stages such as these he reached midwinter, its hearty joys and its snug home life, and then he became simply lyrical. By degrees, the rat began to sit up and join in, his dull eye brightened, and he lost some of his listing air. Presently, the tactful mole slipped away and returned with a pencil and a few half-sheets of paper, which he placed on the table at his friend's elbow. It's quite a long time since you did any poetry, he remarked. You may have a try at it this evening instead of, well, brooding over things so much. I have an idea that you'll feel a lot better when you've got something jotted down, even if it's only just the rhymes. The rat pushed the paper away from him wearily, but the discreet mole took occasion to leave the room, and when he peeped in again some time later, the rat was absorbed and deaf to the world, alternately scribbling and sucking on the top of his pencil. It is true that he sucked a good deal more than he scribbled, but it was joy to the mole to know that the cure had at least begun. We've arrived at chapter 10 here. How is everybody in the chat doing? I know I've been throwing around some fairly deep voices and might need just a moment to recover my voice. So if anyone is listening, I'd be more than happy to have a brief chat with them.
I'm glad to hear you're doing well, Caffrey. And it seems Naruto is also doing such. So that's good to hear. Hmm. I do think, though, that I'll need just a moment here to also sing something. If I'm not careful, doing too many low voices like that in a row tends to stretch out my voice, which is rather painful. So, does anyone have a song that they'd like to suggest that I sing? Ideally, something that's in the public domain. Although, um, I mean, I can certainly acapella things and risk a little bit of confusion at some point. The wheels on the bus go round and round, round and round, round and round. The wheels on the bus go round and round, all through the town. The wipers on the bus go swish, 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 swish. The wipers on the bus go swish, swish, swish. All through the town. The windows on the bus go up and down, up and down, up and down. The windows on the bus go up and down, all through the town. The doors on the bus go open and shut, open and shut. Open and shut, the doors on the bus go open and shut, all through the town. The horn on the bus goes beep, 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 beep. The horn on the bus goes beep, 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 all through the town. The wheels on the bus go round and round, round and round, round and round. The wheels on the bus go round and round, all through the town. Well, what sort of malfunction did you expect to find in motion, Caffrey? And an interesting little fact about wheels on a bus, or any wheel whatsoever, there is always a point at which the wheel is moving exactly zero kilometers an hour or zero miles an hour, and one at which it is moving twice as fast as the rest of the vehicle. Ride the bus GTA style? Does that involve getting on, paying an appropriate fare, and sitting nicely in one of the seats? Because that's the way I prefer you ride a bus. But I'm curious to hear what it is that you'd like to do in terms of your bus riding, Naruto. Caffrey, I'm glad to see you've got some tea. I like this idea, and I should drink something other than the soda, which I have so, so terribly, uh, ill-advisedly begun drinking. Hmm. Stealing the bus and riding it like a monster truck. Well, that sounds like not a great way to do it. I was drinking from a soda can, yes. Um, so, <laughs> my good friend, Easily Bored, uh, has a particular variety of soda that she had been drinking many, many moons prior. And she'd been in a bit of a bad mood, and I was the one tasked with picking up a few groceries, so I thought to pick up one of the drinks that she was particularly fond of. As it turns out, it tastes like a very heavily caffeinated orange soda. Oh, I have some water right here, Naruto, and that's actually what I'm drinking here now.
Fanta? No, Fanta isn't caffeinated as far as I'm aware. Um, let me see what this is called. It is a Mountain Dew Live Wire. So, if you're particularly fond of orange soda and you need caffeine, I suppose that might work for you as well. <laughs> Caffrey, don't accumulate buses. Mm. Excuse me. In fairness, I am not drinking the conventional Mountain Dew. I, I am drinking a variation that is orange soda, rather than urine, uh, to put it politely. He, many sodas have caffeine in them, Naruto, but not all. In fact, most root beers and most fruit sodas do not have caffeine in them. <clears throat> but with this... I suspect we have diverted long enough from the story. If, however, there is a song that somebody would like to hear, I strongly encourage you to put it in the chat, and I will give it a try next time I need to rest my voice. Chapter 10. The Further Adventures of Toad You can live in a bus, you know that? I mean, having lived out of a car, that doesn't surprise me. The front door of the hollow tree faced eastward, so that Toad was called to an early hour, partly by the bright sunlight streaming in on him, partly by the exceeding coldness of his toes, which made him dream that he was at home in his bed on his own handsome room with the Tudor window on a cold winter's night, and his bedclothes had got up, grumbling and protesting they couldn't stand the cold any longer, and had run downstairs to the kitchen fire to warm themselves, and he had followed, on bare feet, along miles and miles of icy stone-paved passages, arguing and beseeching them to be reasonable. He would have probably been aroused much earlier had he not slept for some weeks on straw over stone flags, and almost forgotten the friendly feeling of thick blankets pulled well up round the chin. <laughs> a hike up a mountain at night just to collect dew off the grass. Oh, don't be silly, Caffrey. I had it piped in on live wires, hence why it's orange. After all, we all know electricity is orange. <laughs> Sitting up, he rubbed his eyes first and his complaining toes next, wondered for a moment where he was, looking round for familiar stone wall and little barred window, then with a leap of the heart remembered everything, his escape, his flight, his pursuit, remembered, first and best thing of all, that he was free. Free! The word and the thought alone were worth fifty blankets. He was warm from end to end as he thought of the jolly world outside, waiting eagerly for him to make his triumphal entrance, ready to serve him and play up to him, anxious to help him and to keep him company, as it always had been in the days of old fortune and before misfortune fell upon him. He shook himself and combed the dry leaves out of his hair with his fingers, and confident, hungry but hopeful, all nervous terrors of yesterday dispelled by rest and sleep and frank and heartening sunshine. <laughs> I recommend using an outhouse, but if you are far enough into the wilderness, just make sure to be responsible in how you relieve yourself. He had the world all to himself that early summer morning. The dewy woodland, as he threaded it, was solitary and still. The green fields that had succeeded the trees were his own to do as he liked with. The road itself, when he reached it, in that loneliness was everywhere, seemed like a stray dog to be looking anxiously for company. Toad, however, was looking for something that could talk and tell him clearly which way he ought to go. It is all very well when you have a light heart and a clear conscience and money in your pocket and nobody scouring the country for you to drag you off to prison again to follow where the road beckons and points, not caring whither. The practical toad cared very much indeed, as he could have kicked the road for its helpless silence when every minute was of importance to him.
The reserved rustic road was presently joined by a shy little brother in the shape of a canal, which took its hand and ambled along by its side in perfect confidence, but with the same tongue-tied, uncommunicative attitude towards strangers. Bother them, said Toad to himself. But anyhow, one thing's clear. They must both be coming from somewhere and going to somewhere. You can't get over that, Toad, my boy. So he marched on patiently by the water's edge. Round a bend in the canal came plodding a solitary horse, stooping forward as if in anxious thought. From rope traces attached to his collar stretched a long line taut, but dripping with his stride, the further part of it dripping pearl drops. Toad let the horse pass and stood waiting for what fates were sending him. Hello, Rage. Thank you for reminding me that you're here. It's good to see you. Some extra head pats for you. Oh, what? With a pleasant swirl of quiet water at its blunt bow, the barge slid up alongside of him, its gaily painted gunwale level with the towing path, its sole occupant a big, stout woman wearing a linen sunbonnet, one brawny arm laid along the tiller. A nice... A nice morning, ma'am. Shoot. Oh, I'm sorry, I've read that wrong. A nice morning, ma'am, she remarked to Toad as she drew up level with him. I dare say it is, ma'am, responded Toad politely as he walked along the towpath abreast of her. I dare say it's a nice morning to them that's not in sore trouble like I am. Here's my married daughter. She sends me off post haste to come to her at once, so off I comes, not knowing what may happen or what's going to happen but fearing the worst as you will understand ma'am if you're a mother too and i've left my business to look after itself i'm in the washing and laundering line you must know ma'am and i've left my young children to look after themselves and a more mischievous and troublesome set of young imps doesn't exist ma'am and i've lost all my money and lost my way and as for what may be happening to my married daughter why i don't like to think of it ma'am where might your daughter married daughter be living ma'am she lives next to the river ma'am Close to a fine house called Toad Hall, that somewhere's hereabouts in these parts. Maybe perhaps you've heard of it. Toad Hall? Well, I'm just going that way myself, replied the bargewoman. This canal joins the river some miles further on, a little above Toad Hall, and then it's an easy walk. You come along in the barge with me, I'll give you a lift. She steered the barge close to the bank, and Toad, with many humble and grateful acknowledgments, stepped lightly on board and sat down with great satisfaction. Toad's luck again, thought he. I always come out on top. So you've been the washing business, ma'am, said the bargewoman politely as they glided along. Very good business you've got, too, I dare say, from not making so free and saying so. Fine business in the whole country, said Toad early. All the gentry come to me. Wouldn't go to anyone else if I was paid. They know me so well. You see, I understand my work thoroughly and attend to it all myself, washing, ironing, clear starching, making up gents' fine shirts for evening wear. Everything's done under my own eye. Oh, but surely you don't do all that work yourself, ma'am? Oh, I have girls. Only girls are thereabouts, so who's at work? But you know what girls are, ma'am. Nasty little hussies, that's what I call them. Uh, so do I, said the bargewoman with great heartiness. But I dare say you set yours to rides the idle trollops. And you are very, f and are you very fond of washing? I love it. Simply dote on it. Never so happy as when I've got both arms in the wash tub. But then it comes to me so easy. No trouble at all. Real pleasure, I assure you, ma'am. Oh, what a bit of luck meeting you, observed the bargewoman thoughtfully. Regular peaceful good fortune for both of us. Why would he mean? Don't oh, look at me now. I like washing, too, just the same as you do, and for that matter, whether I like it or not, I've got to do all my own, naturally. Moving about as I do, now my husband, he's such a fellow for shirking his work and leaving the barge to me. At never a moment do I get to see my own affairs. By rights, he ought to be here now, either steering or attending to the horse. Well, luckily, the horse has sense enough to attend to himself. Instead of which, he's gone off with the dog to see if they can't pick up a rabbit for dinner somewhere, so he'll catch me up at the next lock. Well, I'm... So as may be, I don't trust him. Once he gets off with that dog, who knows worse than he is? But meantime, how am I to get on with my washing? 
Ah, uh, never mind about the washing, said Toad, not liking the subject. Try and fix your mind on the rabbit. Nice fun, fat young rabbit, I'll be bound. Bunny onions. I can't fix my mind on anything but the washing. And I wonder why you can be talking of rabbits with such a joyful prospect before you. There's a heap of things of mine you'll find in the corner of the cabin, and just take one or two of the most necessary sort. I won't venture to describe them to a lady like you, but you'll recognize them at a glance. Put them through the washing tub as we go along. Why, it'll be a pleasure to you, as your rattlers say, and a real help to me. You'll find a tub handy and soap and a kettle on the stove and a bucket to haul up the water from the canal with. And then I shall know you're enjoying yourself instead of sitting here idle looking at the scenery and yawning your head off. Naruto, I'm not fond of seeing knives pulled, particularly on Caffrey, but in general. Here, you let me steer, said the toad, now thoroughly frightened, and then you can get on with the washing your own way. I might spoil your things, or not do them as you like. I'm more used to gentlemen's things myself. It's my special line. I'll let you steer. Take some practice to steer a barge properly. Listen, uh, it's still work, and I want you to be happy. No, you shall do the washing you are so fond of, and I'll stick to steering that I understand. Don't try and deprive me of the pleasure you're giving me a treat. Toad was fairly concerned. He looked for his escape this way and that, saw he was too far from the bank for a flying leap, and solemnly resigned himself to his fate. If it comes to that, I suppose any fool can wash. He fetched the tub, soap, and other necessities from the cabin, selected a few garments at random, tried to collect what he had seen in casual glances through the laundry windows, and sat too. A two-story BLT turkey sandwich. I hope you're planning on sharing, Caffrey. A long half hour passed, and every minute of it saw Toad getting crosser and crosser. Nothing that he could do to the things seemed to please them or do them good. He tried coaxing, he tried slapping, he tried punching. They smiled back at him out of the tub, unconverted, happy in their original sin. Once or twice he looked nervously over his shoulder at the barge woman, but she appeared to be gazing out in front of her and absorbed in their steering. His back ached badly, and he noticed with dismay that his paws were beginning to get all crinkly. Now Toad was very proud of his paws. He muttered under his breath words that should never pass the lips of either washerwomen or Toads, and lost the soap for the fiftieth time. A burst of laughter made him straighten himself up and look round. The bargewoman was leaning back and laughing unrestrainedly till the tears ran down her cheeks. Been watching you all this time. I thought you must be a humbug all along. From the conceited way you talk, pretty washerwoman you are. Never washed so much as a dish clout in your life, I say. <laughs> well, Caffrey, if you're not eating it, why are you cutting it? You know, so some of us would actually like to eat. And, you know, tomatoes are nice things. Mm. Mm. Toad's temper, which had been simmering viciously for some time, now fairly boiled over, and he lost all control of himself. You common little fat barge woman, don't you dare talk to your betters like that, wash woman indeed. I would have you know I am a toad, and very well-known, respected, distinguished toad. I may be under a bit of a cloud at present, but I will not be laughed at by a barge woman. The woman moved nearer to him, and peered under his bonnet keenly and closely. Why, so you are, she cried. Well, I never heard nasty crawly toad, and in my nice clean barge, too. Now that is a thing I will not have. She relinquished the tiller for a moment. One big, mottled arm shot out and caught Toad by a foreleg, while the other gripped him fast by a hind leg. The world turned suddenly upside down, the barge seemed to fit lightly across the sky, the wind whistled in his ears, and Toad found himself flying through the air, revolving rapidly as he went. The water, when he eventually reached it with a loud splash, 
proved quite cold enough for his taste, though its chill was not sufficient to quell his proud spirit or slake the heart and the heat of his furious temper. He rose to the surface, sputtering, and when he had wiped the duckweed out of his eyes, the first thing he saw was the fat bargewoman looking back at him over the stern of the retreating barge and laughing, and he vowed, as he coughed and choked, to be even with her. He bummed a ride from the lady, called her fat, and then has a wonder why he's been thrown off the... off the barge. Um... Hmm. Throwing me food. <laughs> I suppose. I appreciate the opportunity to eat anyway. Mm. Mm. <laughs> mm. Well, I appreciate the offer to give me something quite filling, Naruto. I really do. It's nice of you. Not quite sure what a sarlacc pit is. And thank you for the blessings, Capri. <laughs> when he eventually reached it with a loud splash. Oh. All right. He struck out for sure, but the cotton gown greatly impeded his efforts, and when at length he touched land, he found it hard to climb up the bank, unassisted. He had to take a minute or two's rest to recover his breath. Then, gathering his wet skirts well over his arms, he started to run after the barge as fast as his legs would carry him, with wild indignation, thirsting for revenge. I, I don't think I count as a Star Trek nerd, Capri. I, I've seen, like, Lower Decks, Strange New Worlds, and part of Deep Space Nine. Star Wars and Star Trek are about the same age? Oh, that's good to know. Although I think Star Trek is significantly older. I thought it was the 1960s when we first saw Star Trek come into the scenes. I could be remembering wrong. <laughs> the barge woman was still laughing when she drew up when he drew up level with her. Put yourself through the mangle, washerwoman, and eye on your face and crimp it, and you'll quite pass for a decent looking toad. Toad never paused to reply. Solid revenge is what he wanted, not cheap, windy, verbal triumphs, though he had a thing or two in mind that he would have liked to say. He saw what he wanted ahead of him. Running swiftly, on he overtook the horse, unfastened the tow rope, and cast off, jumped lightly on the horse's back, and urged it to gallop by kicking it vigorously on the sides. He steered for open country, abandoning the tow path and swinging the steed down a rutty lane. Once he looked back and saw the barge had run aground on the other side of the canal, and the barge woman was gesticulating wildly and shouting, Stop! 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 I've heard that song before said Toad, laughing as he continued to spur his steed onward in its wild career. Did I not have a childhood? I tell you what, if we finish this story early enough, I will certainly tell you about my childhood. We can talk from there. The barge horse was not capable of any very sustained effort, and its gallop soon subsided with a trot and its trot into an easy walk. But Toad was quite contented with this, knowing that he, at any rate, was moving and the barge was not. He had quite recovered his temper now that he had done something he thought really clever, and he was satisfied to jog along quietly in the sun, steering the horse along byways and bridle paths, trying to forget how very long it was since he had a square meal till the canal had been very far behind him. Every... Well, why do you think my childhood would be depressing? I, I lived that childhood, thank you very much. <laughs> and I'm not terribly unfond of it in its own way. I mean, it was a childhood. <sighs> what have you. 
He had traveled some miles, his horse and he, and he was feeling drowsy in the hot sunshine when the horse stopped, lowered its head, and began to nibble the grass. And Toad, waking up, just saved himself from falling off by an effort. He looked about him and found he was on a wide common, dotted with patches of gorse and bramble as far as he could see. Near him stood a dingy gypsy caravan, and beside it a man was sitting on a bucket turned upside down, very busy smoking and staring out into the wide world. A fire of sticks was burning nearby, and over the fire hung an iron pot, and out of that pot came forth bubblings and gurglings and a vague suggestive steaminess. Also smells, warm, rich, and varied smells, that twined and twisted and wreathed themselves at last into one complete voluptuous perfect smell that seemed like the very na soul of nature taking form and appearing to her children. A true goddess, a mother of solace and comfort, Toad now knew well that he had not been really hungry before. What he had felt early in the day had been a mere trifling qualm. This was the real thing at last, and no mistake. It would have to be dealt with speedily, too, or there would be trouble for somebody or something. He looked the person over carefully, wondering vaguely whether it should be easier to fight him or cajole him. So there he sat and sniffed and sniffed and looked at the person, and the person sat and smoked and looked at him. Ah, hails to my grandmother. Well, that won't be a bad idea at all. Presently, the person took the pipe out of his mouth and remarked in a careless way, What to say, let the house of yours? Toad was take completely taken aback. He did not know that people were fond of horse dealing and never missed an opportunity, and that he had not reflected that caravans were always on the move and took a great deal of drawing. It had not occurred to him to turn the horse into cash, but the gypsy's suggestion seemed a smooth way toward the two things he wanted so badly, ready money and a solid breakfast. What? he said. Me sell this beautiful young horse of mine? Oh no, it's out of the question. Who's going to take the washing home to my customers every week? Besides, I'm too fond of him, and he simply dotes on me. <laughs> Try and love a donkey, some people do. You don't seem to see. That this fine horse of mine is a cut above you altogether. He's a blood horse, he is, partly. Not the part you see, of course, another part. And he's been a prize acne, too, in his time, and that was the time before you knew him, but you can still tell it on him at a glance if you understand anything about horses. No, it's not the thought for a moment. All the same, how much might you be disposed to offer me for this beautiful young horse of mine? Naruto, that is certainly a question, and you're more than welcome to take me at, up on the DMs with it. Or, take take it up with me in the DMs. That's the order. Oh, goodness. The man looked the horse over, and then looked Toad over with equal care, and looked at the horse again. Chilling a leg, he said briefly, and turned away, continuing to spoke and try to stare at the wide world of countenance. Chilling a leg. If you please, I must take a little time to work that out and see what it comes to. Why? Why does he need to count? Zoe! It's good to see you. Hi! I'm glad to know you've joined us tonight. Thank you for coming by. He climbed down off his horse and left it to graze and sat down by the man who did sums on his fingers and at last he said, A shilling a leg? Why, well, that comes to exactly four shillings and no more. Oh, no. I could not think of accepting four shillings for this beautiful young horse of mine. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll make it five shillings and that's three and sixpence more than the animal's worth and that's my last word. The toad sat and pondered long and deeply. Oh, Zoe, if you need more rest, get more rest, girl. Oh, dear. Still, I am glad that you chose to come in here once you started to wake up. Oh, Discord must have switched into streamer mode without my notice. Well, that aside. <laughs> Zoe is an absolutely wonderful person, Naruto. And I will bear no disrespect to order. Hicks, thank you for whatever that is. 
Good to see you. The toad sat and pondered long and deeply, for he was hungry and quite penniless, and still some way he knew not far how far from home, and enemies might still be looking for him. To one in such a situation, five shillings may very well appear a large sum of money. On the other hand, it did not seem very much to get for a horse. But then again, the horse hadn't cost him anything, so whatever he got was clear profit. At last, he said firmly, Look here, my good man. I'll tell you what we will do, and this is my last word. You should hand me over six shillings and six pence, cash down, and further, in addition thereto, you should give me as much breakfast as I can possibly eat, at one sitting, of course, out of that iron pot of yours that keeps sending forth such delicious and exciting smells. In return, I shall make over to you my spirited young horse, with all the beautiful harness and trappings that are on him, freely thrown in. If that's not good enough for you, say so, and I'll be getting on. I know a man near here who's wanted this horse of mine for years. <laughs> I do have the same question, Zoe. Why is that your name? <laughs> it's not something that you much enjoy. Although I've always quite enjoyed the uh, rearrangement of the letters in that. Gypsy grumbled frightfully and declared that if he did a few more deals of that sort, he'd be ruined. But in the end, he lugged a dirty canvas bag out of the depths of his trouser pocket and counted out six shillings and six pence into Toad's paw. Then he disappeared into the caravan for an instant and returned with a large iron plate and a knife and fork and spoon. He tilted up the pot and a glorious stream of hot rich stew gurgled onto the plate. It was indeed the most beautiful stew in the world, being made of partridges and pheasants and chickens and hares and rabbits and peahens and guinea fowls and one or two other things. Toad took his plate from his lap, almost crying, and stuffed and stuffed and stuffed and kept asking for more and the man never grudged at him. He thought that he had never eaten so good a breakfast in all his life. When Toad had taken as much stew on board as he thought he could possibly hold, he got up and said goodbye to the man and took an affectionate farewell to the horse. <gasps> ah, so it's precisely because of the mixture of letters. That's adorable. Let's see here. And the gypsy, who knew the riverside well, gave him directions which way to go, and he set forth on his travels again in the best possible spirits. He was indeed a very different toad from the animal of an hour ago. The sun was shining brightly, his wet clothes were dry again, he had money in his pocket once more, and he was nearing home and friends and safety, and most and best of all, he had a substantial meal, hot and nourishing, and felt big and strong and careless and self-confident. As he tramped along gaily, he thought of his adventures and escapes, and how, when things got, seemed at their worst, he had always managed to find a way out, and his pride and conceit began to swell within him. Ho oh, ho! Oh, he said to himself as he marched along with his chin in the air. What a clever toad I am! There is surely no animal equal to me for cleverness in the whole world. My enemies shut me up in prison, encircled by sentries, watch night and day by warders. I walk out through them all by sheer ability coupled with courage. They pursue me with engines and policemen and revolvers. I snap my fingers at them and vanish, laughing into space. I am unfortunately thrown into a canal by a woman fat of body and very evil-minded. What of it? I swim ashore, seize her horse, ride off in triumph, and I sell the horse for a whole pack of little money and an excellent breakfast. <laughs> I am the toad, the handsome, the popular, the successful toad. He got so puffed up with conceit that he made it a song as he walked in praise of himself and sang it at the top of his voice, though there was no one to hear it but him. It was, perhaps, the most conceited song that any animal ever composed. <laughs> hmm. And this, what's this about gaiety, Naruto? Mm. <laughs> oh, do I want to sing this in a Toad voice? Or perhaps I should sing it in a voice that sounds like what Toad thinks he sounds like. You know, that's an interesting question. Hmm.
Uh, well, I would start a poll, but for some reason the poll does not seem to want to cooperate with me. So, in the chat, if you wouldn't mind replying either yes or no, would you like to hear me use the toad voice? Yes, yes, I haven't accepted affiliateship at this point. You're not wrong. And I'm sure that probably is why it decided not to do the poll, despite giving me the option to set one up. Okay, Hicks would like to hear it in Toad's voice. Yeah, it still doesn't work. Sorry, Kefri. <sighs> well, I'll have to consider that affiliate ship a little more strongly then. It's something I've been holding off on, but... Who knows? If it's going to get in the way of my interacting with people, it's going to. So I have one vote for doing it in the Toad voice. Alright. Fine. No apologies for it, Kefri. But, uh, yes. Ten, nine, eight, seven... Six, five, four, three, two, one. The world has held great heroes, as history books have showed, but never a name to go down to fame compared to that of Toad. <laughs> the clever men at Oxford. Um... What do you mean, Naruto? It, that I automatically become affiliate after a while? I'm confused. Please explain when you get a moment. Clever men at Oxford know all that there is to be known, but then of them have known... None of them know one half as much as intelligent Mr. Toad. The animals sat in the ark and cried, their tears in torrents flowed. Who was it said, there's land ahead? Encouraging Mr. Toad. The army all saluted as they marched along the road. Was it the king or the kitchener? No, it was Mr. Toad. The queen and her ladies in waiting sat at the window and sewed. She cried, Look who's that handsome man? They answered, Mr. Toad. There's a great deal more of the same sort, but too dreadfully conceited to be written down. These are some of the milder verses. He sang as he walked, and he walked and he sang, and got more inflated every minute, but his pride was shortly to have a severe fall. Um, so, Kefri, I still haven't finished reading through the terms of affiliateship. Uh, Easily Bored has indicated that there are some terms in there that I might find rather objectionable, particularly ones relating to streaming on other platforms. Uh, Naruto, in terms of them moving me automatically to affiliate, they would have a couple of problems with that. Uh, one of the things that happens when you qualify for affiliate is they require you to have two-factor authentication set up. I do not. Mr. Bezos will have to buy me dinner before he gets my number. And the uh, I, I have to accept some additional terms from Twitch. Without taking care of those two steps, well, that and I have to actually give them my bank account information. Which, you know, being me, of course Amazon doesn't have my bank account information. Why would I give it to them when I don't do business with them? But, uh, assuming that the terms are something I'm amenable to, and if we really want, we can read those at the end of stream, but boy, I, I think literally anything else would be more interesting. Um... Uh, Assuming the terms are amenable, I may still do so. After some miles of country lanes, he reached the high road, and as he turned onto it and glanced along its wide width length, he saw approaching him a speck that turned to a dot, and then into a blob, and then something very familiar. A double note of warning, only too well known, fell on his delighted ear. This is something like, said the excited toad. This is real life again. This is once more the great world from which I have been missed so long. I will hail them, my brothers of the wheel, and pitch them a yarn of the sort that has been so successful hitherto. And they will give me a lift, of course. And then I will talk to them some more, and perhaps with luck, it may even end in my driving up to Tone Hall in a motor car. 
That will be one in the eye for Badger. Mm. Feel free to look it up, Naruto. I'd appreciate the additional eyes on it. He stepped confidently out into the road to hail the motor car, which came along at an easy pace, slowing down as it neared the lane, when suddenly he became very pale. His heart turned to water, his knees shook and yielded under him, and he doubled up and collapsed in a sickening pain in his interior. And while he might the unhappy animal, for the approaching car was the very one he had stolen out of the yard of the Red Lion Hotel on that fatal day when all his troubles began. And the people in it were the very same people he had sat and watched at luncheon in the coffee room. <laughs> Makes sense, Kefri. He sank down in a shabby, miserable heap in the road, murmuring to himself in his despair, It's all up. It's all over now. Chains and policemen again. Prison over again. Dry bread and water again. Oh, what a fool I've been. Why did I go to strutting about the country fight for? Singing conceited songs and hailing people in broad daylight in the high road instead of hiding till nightfall and slipping home quietly in my back ways. Oh, hapless toad, a will fated animal. Terrible motor car drew slowly nearer and nearer till at last he heard it stop just short of him. Two gentlemen got out and walked round the trembling heap of crumpled misery lying in the road, and one of them said, Oh dear, it's very sad. He is a poor thing. A showman, apparently, who has fainted in the road. Perhaps she's overcome by heat, the poor creature. Perhaps she's not had any food today. Let's lift her into the car and take her to the nearest village, where doubtless she has friends. They tenderly lifted Toad into the motor car and propped him up in soft cushions and proceeded on their way. When Toad heard them talk so kind and sympathetic away, he knew he was not recognized. His courage began to revive, and he cautiously opened first one eye and then the other. Rook, said one of the gentlemen, she's better already. The fresh air is doing her good. How do you feel now, ma'am? Uh, thank you kindly, sir, said the toad in a feeble voice. I'm feeling a great deal better. Oh, that's right. Now keep quite still, and above all, don't try to talk. I was only thinking if I might sit on the front seat there beside the driver, I could get the full fresh air in my face. I would soon be all right again. Ah, oh, what a very sensible woman. Of course you shall. So they carefully helped Toad into the front seat beside the driver, and on they went again. Toad was almost himself again by now. He sat up, looked about him, and tried to beat down the tremors, the yearnings, the old cravings that rose up again and beset him and took possession of him entirely. It is fate, he said to himself. Will I strive? Will I struggle? And he turned to the driver to decide. Please, sir. Would you kindly let me try and drive the car a little? I've been watching you carefully, and it looks so easy and interesting, and I should like to be able to tell my friends that at once I had driven a motor car. The driver laughed at the proposal so heartily that the gentleman inquired what the matter was. When he heard, he said to Toad's delight, Brother, madam, I like your spirit. I'd have a try and look after her. She won't do any harm. Toad eagerly scrambled into the seat vacated by the driver, took the steering wheel in his hands, listened with affected humility to the instruction given to him, set the car in motion, but very slowly and carefully at first, and it was determined for he was determined to be prudent. The gentlemen behind clapped their hands and applauded Toad, and and Toad heard them saying, Oh well she does it. I'd see a washerwoman driving a car as well as that the first time. Toad went a little faster, then faster, still and faster. He heard the gentleman call out warningly, Be careful, washerwoman! And this annoyed him and he began to lose his head. The driver tried to interfere, but he pinned him down to the seat with one elbow and put on full speed. The rush of air in his face, the hum of the engines, the light jump of the car beneath him intoxicated his weak brain. Washerwoman indeed! Ho ho! I am the toad, the motor car snatcher, the prison breaker, the toad who always escapes. Sit still and you shall know what driving really is, for you are in the hands of the famous, the skillful, the entirely fearless toad! Hmm. Well, Naruto, like I said, we'll have to take a look at it later. But I appreciate you looking out for me like this. Thank you. With a cry of horror, the whole party rose and flung themselves on him. Seize him! Seize the toad! The wicked animal stole a motor car! Find him! Shine him! Drag him down to the nearest police station! Down with the desperate and dangerous toad! Alas, they should have thought they ought to be have been more prudent. They should have remembered to stop the motor car somewhere before playing any pranks of that sort. 
With a half turn of the wheel, Toad sent the car crashing through the low hedge that ran alongside the road. One mighty bound, a violent shock, and the wheels of the car were churning up the thick mud of a horse pond. Toad found himself flying through the air with a strong upward rush and delicate curve of a swallow. He liked the motion and was just beginning to wonder whether it would go on until he developed wings and turned into a toad bird when he landed on his back with a thump in the soft, rich grass of a meadow. Sitting up, he could just see the motor car in the pond nearly submerged. The gentleman and the driver, encumbered by their long coats, were floundering helplessly in the water. What is a schmeckle? But that's good to hear, Kefri, that Twitch partners are able to stream on other platforms as well. At the same time, I'm a fair ways off from partner status. <laughs> but I appreciate it all the same. He picked himself up rapidly and set off running across the country as hard as he could, scrambling through hedges, jumping ditches, pounding across fields, till he was breathless and weary and had to settle down into an easy walk. When he had recovered his breath somewhat and was able to think calmly, he began to giggle, and from giggling he took to laughing, and he laughed till he had to sit down under a hedge. Ho ho ho! He cried in ecstasies of self-admiration. Toad again. Oh, this usual comes out on top. Who was it that got them to give him a lift? Who managed to get in the front seat for the sake of fresh air? Who persuaded them into letting him see if he could drive? Who landed them all on horse pond? Who escaped flying gaily and unscathed through the air, leaving a narrow-minded, grudging, timid excursionist in the mud where they should rightly be? Why, Toad, of course. Clever Toad. Great Toad. Good Toad. Then he burst into song again and chanted with an uplifted voice. The murder car went boop, boop, boop as it raced along the road. Who was it steered into a pond? Ingenious Mr. Toad. Oh, how clever I am. Oh, how clever. Oh, how clever. Oh, very clever. A slight noise at a distance behind him made him turn his head and look. Oh, horror. Oh, misery. Oh, despair. About two fields off, a chauffeur in his leather gaiters and two large rural policemen were visible, running towards him as hard as they could go. Poor Toad sprang to his feet and pelted away again, his heart in his mouth. Oh, my. What an ass I am, what a conceited and heedless ass, swaggering again, shouting and singing songs again, sitting still and gassing again. Oh my, oh my, oh my. He glanced back and saw to his dismay that they were still gaining on him. On he ran desperately, but looking back, he saw that they still gained steadily. He did his best, he was a fat animal and his legs were short, and they still gained. He could hear them close behind him now, ceasing to heed where he was going. Oh, hi, Dragon Queen. It's good to see you. Thank you for dropping in. Uh, Naruto, I will consider that a little bit later on here, but I appreciate it. In fact, uh, I know Queen has just started doing her own streaming, and so if you get a chance, giving her a follow could really help her out quite a bit. He glanced back and saw to his dismay that they were gaining on him. On he ran desperately, but kept looking back and saw that they still gained steadily. He did his best, but he was a fat animal and his legs were short and still they gained. He could hear them close behind him now, ceasing to heed where he was going. He struggled on blindly, wildly looking back over his shoulder at the now triumphant enemy. When suddenly the earth failed under his feet, he grasped at the air and splash! He found himself over ears in deep water, rapid water. Water that bore him along with a force that could not be contended with, and he knew, in blind panic, he'd run straight into the river. I've been doing quite well, thank you, Road. And you know, Naruto, that is a good point. Although it's going to make me wait just a little bit before shouting her out again. All right. <laughs> well. But yes, Road, thank you for dropping in. It's good to see you. He rose to the surface and tried to grasp the reeds and the rushes that grew along the water's edge close under the bank. But the stream was so strong that it tore them out of his hands. Oh my! <laughs> Gasped the poor toad. If ever I steal motor car again, if ever I sing another conceited song. Then down he went and came up breathless and spluttering. 
Presently he saw that he was approaching a big dark hole in the bank, just above his head, and as the stream bore him past, he reached up with a paw and caught hold of the edge and held on. Then slowly and with difficulty he drew himself up out of the water, till at last he was able to rest his elbows on the edge of the hole. There he remained for some minutes, puffing and panting, for he was quite exhausted. As he sighed and blew and stared before him into the dark hole, some bright small things shone up and twinkled in its steps, moving toward him, and as it approached, a face grew up gradually around it, and it was a familiar face brown and small with whiskers, grave and round with neat ears and silky hair. It was the water rat. <laughs> I know that Nightbot can be quite useful. And yes, Zoe, most fantastic of people, if you're not following, absolutely do. Um, she has played some pretty solid games recently. She's really a very calming, uh, very gentle voice. It's, it's quite similar to mine in many ways. And just... <laughs> Next is Road. <sighs> you know what, Naruto? Fine. Let's, uh... Let's see if I can do this here. All right. Naruto, if you wouldn't mind shouting out people as they come in, I would greatly appreciate the additional effort. Thank you for reminding me. With that said, though, we have just about come to a break in the chapter. Oh, thank you for the boops, Ton. Please boop him right back for me. <laughs> uh, it's the slash shout out command. I don't have Nightbot in this chat. Like Summer Tempest Came His Tears. Well, that's an ominous chapter title. Oh, Naruto, I have every faith in your abilities in this regard. Ah, <sighs> all right. So, does anyone have a proposal for the song between chapters here? I do like to do something to stretch out my voice just a little bit between. If for no other reason, then I don't really want to end up with the having to stop early over things like that. Hello, Tiny! It's good to see you! Ah, oh, heck, and just after I've used my shout-out, it's going to be a minute before I can shout you out here, but Tiny Foxtrot, thank you so much for dropping in. Uh, we are, in fact, reading The Wind in the Willows. Uh, I will try and get the VOD for this up as soon as I can manage. Um, but, yeah, no, uh, for those who aren't aware, Tiny Foxtrot has been doing a fantastic job uh, operating a fundraiser for the World Wildlife Foundation. Um, she... er... <sighs> Tiny Foxtrot pronoun check. I believe you've said any pronouns uh, work for you, but I just want to make sure. Um, but Tiny Fox, any pronouns, perfect. Um, yes, Tiny Foxtrot is absolutely fantastic. Has done a wonderful job raising over, uh, was it five hundred and ninety dollars uh, last time I checked? That uh, had been raised in order to help save the coral reefs. <laughs> Big and dumb? Oh, I wouldn't dare to do such a thing to Tiny. You reached $600 raised in order to help save the coral reefs. Absolutely delighted. Congratulations, Tiny. Naruto, if you wouldn't mind checking periodically and giving Tiny a shout out once uh, the timeout expires on that, I would really appreciate it. But yes, Tiny, um, this is the book that you had originally proposed, so... Um, it's been a delightful one, and we are actually at chapter 11. We have nearly finished this book. <laughs> the community is kind, and you are also kind, Tiny. It grows kind around you because of the fantastic job you do, sharing kindness, empathy, and just the general gremlin delight that you bring to everyone. So, thank you. 
Like summer tempests came his tears. The rat put out a neat little brown paw, gripped Ro Toad firmly by the scruff of the neck, and gave a great hoist and pull, and the waterlogged Toad came up slowly but surely over the edge of the hole, till at last he stood safe and sound in the hall, streaked with mud and weed, to be sure, with the water streaming off of him, but happy and high-spirited as of old, now that he found himself once more in the house of a friend, and lodging and Dodging's innovations were over, and he could lay aside a disguise that was unworthy of his position and wanted such a lot of living up to. Already, he cried. I've been through such times since I saw you last. You can't think. Such trials, such sufferings, and also nobly born. Thank you, Na uh, thank you, Naruto. Well done. I really appreciate it. Then such escapes, such disguises, such subterfuges, and all so cleverly planned and carried out. Been in prison? Got out of it, of course. Been thrown in a canal? Swam ashore? Stole a horse? Sold him for a large sum of money? Humbugged everybody? Made them all do exactly what I wanted? Oh, I am smart, Toad. Make no mistake. What do you think my last exploit was? Just hold on till I tell you. Toad, said the water rat gravely and firmly. You go off upstairs at once, and take off that old cotton rag that looks as if it might formerly have belonged to some washerwoman, and clean yourself thoroughly, and put on some clothes, and try and come down looking like a gentleman if you can. For more shabby, bedraggled, disreputable looking object than you are, I've never set eyes on in my whole life. Now stop swaggering and arguing and be off. I'll have something to say to you later. <laughs> Toad was at first inclined to stop and do some talking back at him. He had had enough of being ordered about when he was in prison, and here were the things begun all over again, apparently. And by a rat, too! However, he caught sight of himself in the looking glass over the hat stand, with the hat ru rusty black bonnet perched rakishly over one eye, and he changed his mind and went very quickly and humbly upstairs to the rat's dressing room. There he had a thorough wash and brush up, changed his clothes, and stood for a long time before the glass, contemplating himself with pride and pleasure and thinking what utter idiots all the people must have been to have ever mistaken him for one moment for a washerwoman. By the time he came down again, at luncheon was on the table, and very glad Toad was to see it, for he had been through some trying experiences, and had taken much hard exercise since the excellent breakfast provided for him by the traveller. While they ate, Toad told the rat all his adventures, dwelling chiefly on his own cleverness, and presence of mind in emergencies, and cunning in tight places, and rather making out that he had been having a gay and highly colored experience. But the more he talked and boasted, the more grave and silent the rat became. When at last Toad had talked himself to a standstill, there was a silence for a while, and then the rat said, Now, nah, Toady, I don't want to give you pain after all you've been through already, but seriously, don't you see what an awful ass you've been to making of yourself? On your own admission, you've been handcuffed, imprisoned, starved, chased, terrified out of your life, insulted, jeered at, and ignominiously flung into the water. And by a woman, too. Where's the amusement in that? Where does the fun come in? And all because you needs go and steal a motor car. You know the first thing, you've never had anything but trouble from motor cars from the moment you first set eyes on one. But if you will be mixed up with them, as you generally are, five minutes after you started, why steal them? Be a cripple if you think it's exciting, be bankrupt for a change if you set your mind on it. But why choose to be a convict? When you are, you going to be sensible and think of your friends, and try and credit them do you suppose it's any pleasure for me, for instance, to hear animals saying, as I go about, I'm the chap that keeps company with jailbirds? <laughs> All rage, still curling up, I see. Hmm. And 
yes, indeed. There are occasionally words that I might change out of uh, deference to other people, I would say, Naruto. But gay is never a curse word. We very much support gay people around here. Life's hard enough without being mean to people who are often wonderful and just enjoying lovely people in their company. Now, it was very comforting point in Toad's character that he was a thoroughly good-hearted animal and never minded being jawed by those who were his real friends. And even when most set upon a thing, he was always able to see the other side of the question. So although, while Rat was talking so seriously, he kept saying to himself mutinously, But it was fun, though. Awful fun. And making strange suppressed noises inside of him. Uh, and... Ooh. And other sounds resembling stifled snorts, or the opening of soda water bottles. Yet when Rat had quite finished, he heaved a deep sigh and said, very nicely and humbly, Why, why, Ratty, how uh, sound you always are. Yes, as I've been a conceited old ass, I can quite see that. But now I'm going to be a good toad and not do it anymore. As for motor cars, I've not been at all so keen about them since my last ducking in that river of yours. The fact is, while I was hanging on to the edge of your hole and getting my breath, I had a sudden idea. A really brilliant idea, connected with motor boats. There, there. Don't take on so old chap and stamp and upset things. It was only an idea, and we won't talk about it any more. Now we'll have our coffee and a smoke and quiet chat, and I'm going to stroll quietly down to Toad Hall and get into clothes of my own and set things going again on the old lines. I've had enough of adventures, and I shall lead a quiet, steady, respectable life, pottering about my property and improving it, and doing a little landscape gardening at times. There will always... Hmm. Sorry. Oh, let's see, where did I leave myself? There will always be a bit of dinner for my friends when they come to see me, and I should keep a pony chase to jog about the country in, just as I used to in the good old days before I got reckless and wanted to do things. Stroll quietly down to Toad Hall. What are you talking about? Do you mean to say you haven't heard? Heard what? Go on, Ratty. Quick. Don't spare me. What haven't I heard? Do you mean to tell me? Shouted the rat, thumping with his little fist on the table. You've heard nothing of the stoats and weasels? What, the wild wooders? Cried the toad, trembling in every limb. No, not a word. Well, what have they been doing? And how they've been... And how they've been... And taken toad whole, continued the rat. Toad leaned his elbow on the table, and his chin on his paws, and a large tear welled up in each of his eyes, overflowed, and splashed on the table. Plop, plop. Go on, Ratty. He murmured presently. Tell me all. The worst is over. I am an animal again. I can bear it. When you got into that, tr that trouble of yours, said the rat, slowly and impressively, I mean... When you disappeared from society for a time, oh, that misunderstanding about a, a machine, you know. Toad merely nodded. Well, it was a good deal talked about down here naturally, not only along Riverside, but even in the wild wood. Animals took sides, as always happens. The river bank is stuck up for you and said you'd been infamously treated, and there was no justice to be had in the land nowadays. But the wild wood animals said hard things and served you right, and it was time this sort of thing was stopped. And they got very cocky about saying you were done for this time, you'd never come back again. Never, never. The toad nodded once more, keeping silence. That's the sort of little beast they are, the rat went on. But Moe and Badger, they stuck out, grew thick and thin, that you would come back again soon somehow didn't exactly know how, but somehow. Toad began to sit up in his chair again and smirk a little. They argued from history. They said no criminal laws had ever been known to prevail against cheek and plausibility such as yours, combined with the power of a long purse. So they arranged to move their things into Toad Hall and sleep there and keep it ahead and have it all ready for you when you turned up. 
They didn't guess what was going to happen, of course. Still, they had their suspicions of the wild woods animals. Now, I come along the most painful and tragic part of my story. One dark night, it was a very dark night, and blowing hard too, and raining simply cats and dogs. A band of weasels, armed to the teeth, crept silently up the carriage drive to the front of the house. Simultaneously, a body of desperate ferrets, advancing through the kitchen garden, possessed themselves of the backyard and offices, by a company of skirmishing stoats who thought nothing, who struck at nothing, occupied the conservatory and the billiard room, and held the French windows opening all the morn. The mole and the badger were sitting. Uh, the mole and the badger were sitting by the fire in the smoking room, telling stories and suspecting nothing. It wasn't a night for any animals to be out, and when those bloodthirsty villains broke down the doors and rushed in upon them from every side, they made the best fight they could. But what was the good? They were unarmed and taken by surprise. What could two animals do against hundreds? took and beat them severely with sticks and those two poor faithful creatures and turned them out into the cold and the wet with many insulting and uncalled for remarks. Here the unfeeling toad broke into a snigger and then pulled himself together and tried to look particularly solemn. Wow, toad, you don't deserve these good friends by any stretch. The wildwooders have been living in toad hole ever since, continued the bat. And getting on simply anyhow, lying in bed at the day and breakfast at all hours, and the place in such a mess, I'm told, is not fit to be seen. Eating your grub and drinking your drink and making bad jokes about you, and singing vulgar songs about, well, about prisons and magistrates and policemen, horrid personal songs with no humour in them, and the telling of tradespeople and everybody they've come to stay for good. So oh, have they? said the toad, getting up and seizing a stick. I'll jolly soon see about that. That's no good, toad. You'll only come back and come back and sit down. you only get into trouble. But the toad was off and there was no holding him. He marched rapidly down the road, stick over his shoulder, fuming and muttering to himself in his anger, till he got near the front gate, when suddenly there popped up from behind the paint my palings a long yellow ferret with a gun. Who comes from there? said the ferret sharply. Stuff and nonsense. What do you mean talking like that to me? Uh, ah, dog, they wanted that's absolutely the wrong voice. Stuff and nonsense, the toad very angrily. What do you mean by talking like that to me? Come out of that at once, or I'll... The ferret never said a word, but he brought his gun up to his shoulder. The toad prudently dropped flat in the road, and bang, a bullet whistled over his head. The startled toad scrambled to his feet and scampered off down the road as hard as he could, and as he ran, he heard the ferret laughing and other horrid little laughs, taking it up and carrying on the sound. He went back, very crestfallen, and told the water rat. What did I tell you? said the rat. It's no good. They've got sentries pasted. They're all armed. You must wait. Still, toad was not inclined to give in all at once, so he got out of the boat and set off rowing up the river to where the guard in front of Toad Hall came down to the waterside. Mists, hello! Thank you for the raid! Wonderful to see you! <laughs> oh, and for those who aren't aware, uh, the System of Mists are a partner of Road to Dusk, a uh, general friend of the chat here, Star Mari, hello! Thank you for joining in tonight. Uh, not entirely certain how I feel about the face, <laughs> but I'm glad you're happy to be here. <laughs> oh, thank you both. Um, but yes, the System of Mists have recently started streaming for themselves. Um, they've also been a companion on Coffee Talk with me on multiple occasions, um, and just are generally an interesting font of knowledge, uh, particularly pertaining to uh, Hellenic mythology and the history involved with it. Um, yes, System of Mists. So uh, the Mists are actually a group of dissociative... I, 
I am not certain precisely how to describe this, um, but it's uh, a form of dissociative identity. Uh, so a neurodivergence in this particular case, I believe. Um, unfortunately, I don't share those experiences. Oh, hello, Legal. Of course you can get a hug. Oh, it's delightful to see you. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Road. Um, Road to Dusk is a little bit better versed in this, and by that I mean is actually very solidly educated and informed, and shares some experiences there. Um, as for you, Legal, let's absolutely get you a hug. Thank you for joining in, everyone. It's good to see you. So, yes, we have just found out that Toad Hall has been taken over by a group of bandits, and Toad would very much like to go home to it. Um, for anyone who is new to my channel, I am primarily a storyteller. Uh, you'll often see me reading books from the public domain. Um, I also sometimes drop into other people's streams, especially if they're in need of a voice actress. <laughs> oh, cute box. Okay, let's, uh, let's get the cute box going here. Uh, do, do, do. uh that left an axis in there. Let's uh let's tweak that. There we are. All right. <laughs> and yes, uh, with that, let's continue on. Still, Toad was not inclined to give in all at once. So he got out of the boat and set off rowing up the river to where the garden of front of Toad Hall came down to the waterfront. Arriving within sight of his old home, he rested on his oars and surveyed the land cautiously. All seemed very peaceful and deserted and quiet. He could see the whole front of Toad Hall glowing in the evening sunshine, the pigeons settling by twos and threes along the straight line of the roof. The garden, a blaze of flowers, the creek that led up to the boathouse, the little wooden bridge that crossed it, all tranquil, uninhabited, apparently waiting for his return. He would try the boathouse first, he thought. Very warily, he paddled up to the mouth of the creek and was just passing under the bridge when crash! A great stone dropped from above, smashed through the bottom of the boat. It filled and sank, and Toad found himself struggling in deep water. Looking up, he saw two stoats leaning over the parapet of the bridge and watching him with great glee. It will be your head next time, Toady, they called out to him. The indignant Toad swam to the shore, where the stoats laughed and laughed, supporting each other, and laughed again till they nearly had two fits. That is, one fit each, of course. The Toad retraced his weary way on foot and related his disappointing experiences to the water out once more. Well, what did I tell you? said the rat very crossly. And now look, see, see what you've been and done. Lost my boat that I was so fond of. That's what you've done. I simply ruined that nice suit of clothes I lent you. Really, Toad, of all the trying animals, I wonder you managed to keep any friends at all. The Toad saw at once how wrongly and foolishly he had acted. He admitted his errors and wrongheadedness, and made a full apology to Rat for losing his boat and spoiling his clothes. And he wound up by saying, with the frank self-surrender that always disarmed his friend's criticism and won them back to his side, Ratty, I see I have been a headstrong and willful toad. Henceforth, believe me, I will be humble and submissive, and I will take no action without your kind advice and full approval. <laughs> well, we haven't heard that before. If that really is so the good-natured rat, already appears, and my advice to you is, considering the lateness of the hour, to sit down and have your supper, which will be on the table in a minute, 
and be very patient, for I am convinced we can do nothing until we've seen the Mole and Badger and heard their latest news and held conference and taken their advice on this difficult matter. Oh, uh, yes, of course, the Mole and the Badger, said the Toad lately. What's become of them, dear fellows? I'd forgotten all about them. Despite the fact that they stayed in your house to try and prevent it from invasion and fought off the invaders as hard as they could. Toad. Well, may you ask, said the rat reproachfully, while you were riding about the countryside in expensive motor cars and galloping proudly on blood horses and breakfasting on the fat of the land, those two poor devoted animals have been camping out in the open in every sort of weather, living very rough day by day, living very hard out by night, watching over your house, patrolling your boundaries, keeping a constant eye on the stoats and the weasels, scheming and planning and contriving how to get your property back for you. You don't deserve to have such true and loyal friends. Don't you don't, really. Some day, when it's too late, you'll be sorry you didn't value them more while you had them. I'm an ungrateful beast, I know sobbed Toad, shedding bitter tears. Let me go out and find them, out into the cold, dark night, and share their hardships, and try and prove by Or on a bit, surely I heard the clink of dishes on tray. Supper's here at last. Hooray. Come on, Ratty. The rat remembered that poor Toad had been on prison fare for a considerable time, and that large allowances therefore had to be made. He followed him to the table accordingly, and hospitality encouraged him in his gallant efforts to make up for past privations. They had just finished their meal and resumed their armchairs when there came a heavy knock at the door. Toad was nervous, but the rat, nodding mysteriously at him, went straight up to the door and opened it, and in walked Mr. Badger. He had all the appearance of one who for some nights had been kept away from home, and all its little comforts and conveniences. His shoes were covered with mud, and he was looking very rough and tousled, but then he had never been a very smart man, the badger. At the best of times, he came solemnly up to Toad, shook him by the paw, and said, Welcome home, Toad. Alas, what am I saying? Welcome home, indeed. This is a poor homecoming, unhappy Toad. Then he turned his back on him and sat down on the table and drew up his chair and helped himself to a large slice of cold pie. Oh, heck, that was the badger, not the mole. Toad was quite alarmed at this very serious and portentous style of greeting, but the rat whispered to him, Never mind, don't take any notice and don't say anything to him just yet. He's always rather low and despondent when he's wanting his victuals. In half an hour's time is when he'd be quite a different animal. So they waited in silence, and presently there came another and lighter knock. The rat, with a nod to Toad, went to the door and ushered in the mole, very shabby and unwashed, with bits of hay and straw sticking to his fur. Hooray! Here's old Toad, cried the mole, his face beaming. Fancy having you back again. And he began to dance round him. I never dreamt you would turn up so soon. Well, you must have managed to escape, you clever and genius intelligent Toad. The rat alarmed, pulled him by the elbow, but it was too late. Toad was puffing and swelling already. Clever? Oh, no. I'm not really clever, according to my friends. I've only broken out of the strongest prison in England, that's all. And captured a railway train and escaped on it, that's all. And disguised myself and going about the country humbugging everybody, that's all. Oh, uh, no. I'm a stupid ass, I am. I'll tell you one or two of my little adventures, Mole, and you shall judge for yourself. Well, well, said the mole, moving toward the supper table. Supposing you talk while I eat. Not a bite since breakfast. Oh my, oh my. And he sat down and helped himself liberally to cold beef and pickles. Toad straddled on the hearth rug, he thrust his paw into his trouser pocket, and pulled out a handful of silver. Look at that. That's not so bad, is it, for a few minutes' work? And how do you think I done it, mole? Or stealing. That's how I done it. Go on, Toad said the mole, immensely interested. Toad, please do be quiet. And don't you egg him on, mole, when you know it he is. But please tell as soon as it's possible what the position is and what's to be done now that Toad's back at last. 
swear word? Um, I'm sorry, I, I must have missed where there was a swear word. Oh, I generally think of that as more like a donkey. But, um, that, that's fair. Thank you for catching that, Naruto. Um, I suppose we'll have to be a little more careful about that word. Uh, legal, if you eat a book, you won't get smarter. But if you listen to someone reading a book or read a book for yourself, you may just find your world expanded a little bit. And, if you're interested in making yourself smarter, just spending time listening, paying attention, you'll find that things do come to you slightly more easily, simply from being, from experiencing, and from sharing with others. How do I know? Hmm. I am not going to answer that. The position's about as bad as it can be, replied the mole grumpily. And as for what's to be done, what blessed if I know? The badger and I have been round and round the place by night and day, always the same thing. Sentries posted everywhere, guns poked out at us, stones thrown at us, always an animal on the lookout, and when they see us, my, how they do laugh. That's what annoys me the most. It's a very difficult situation, said the rat, reflecting deeply. But I think I see now, in the depths of my mind, what Toad really ought to do. I tell you, he ought to... No, he oughtn't, said the mole, full of his mouth full. Nothing of this sort. You don't understand. What he ought to do is he ought to... Well, I shan't do it anyway, said the Toad, getting excited. I'm not going to be ordered about by you fellows. It's my house we're talking about, and I know exactly what to do. And I'll tell you, I'm going to... By this time, they were all three talking at once at the top of their voices, and the noise was simply deafening when a thin, dry voice made itself heard, saying, Be quiet at once, all of you. And instantly, everyone was silent. It was the badger, who, having finished his pie, had turned round in his chair and was looking at them severely. When he saw that, he had secured their attention and that they were evidently waiting for him to address them, he turned back to the table again and reached out for the cheese. And so great was the respect commanded by solid qualities of that admirable animal that not another word was uttered until he had quite finished his repast and brushed the crumbs from his knees. The toad fidgeted a good deal, but the rat held him firmly down. When Badger had quite done, he got up from his seat and stood before the fireplace, reflecting deeply. At last he spoke. Toad, you bad, troublesome little animal. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? What do you think your father, my old friend, would have said if he had been here tonight and had known of all your goings on. Hello, cute little angel. It's good to see you. Thank you for dropping in. I'm glad to have you with us here, too. <clears throat> Sorry, I do need a little stretch here. Toad, who was on the sofa by this time with his legs rolled up over his face, shaken by sobs of contrition. <laughs> mm. There, there, went on Badger more kindly. <laughs> Never mind. Stop crying. We're going to let bygones be bygones and try to turn over a new leaf. But what the mole says is quite true. The stoats are on guard at every point, and they make the best sentinels in the world. It's quite useless to think of attacking the place. They're too strong for us. <laughs> then it's all over. 
sobbed the Toad, crying into the sofa cushions. I shall go and enlist for a soldier, and never see my dear Toad Hall anymore. Come, cheer up, Toady, said the Badger. There are more ways of getting back a place than taking it by storm. I haven't said my last word yet. Now I'm going to tell you a great secret. Lika's quite right. Angel is adorable. Zoe is too, though. <laughs> ah, yep. Thank you for the shout out, Arata. I appreciate it. Toad sat up slowly and dried his eyes. Secrets had an immense attraction for him because he never could keep one. But he enjoyed the sort of unhallowed thrill he experienced when he went and told another animal after having faithfully promised not to. Why do they want to give this toad any help whatsoever? There is an underground passage, said the badger impressively, that leads from the river bank quite near here, right up to the middle of Toad Hall. Zoe, you okay there, dearie? It's quite the stare. Oh, nonsense, Badger, he said rather airily. You've been listening to some of the yarns they spin in the public houses about here. I know every inch of Toad Hall, the inside and out. Nothing of the sort, I do assure you. Yes, cute little angel is a Kingdom Hearts fan, as is Road to Dusk. I'm quite amused at how many people within my circles are just enamored of this game, and moreover the franchise itself. It must be a very nice rabbit hole to tumble down. My young friend, your father, who was a worthy animal, a lot worthier than some Others I know was a particular friend of mine and told me a great deal he wouldn't have dreamt of telling you. He discovered that passage. He didn't make it, of course. That was done hundreds of years before he ever came to live there. And he repaired it and cleaned it out because he thought it might come in useful someday in case of trouble or danger. And he showed it to me. Don't let my son know about it, he said. He's a good boy, but very light and volatile in character and simply cannot hold his tongue. If he's ever in a real fix, and it would be of use to him, you may tell him about the secret passage. But not before. Well, Eagle, if you're interested, I'm guessing Cute Little Angel's VODs should still be up. Uh, I know she's been playing a few, uh, through, I think it's the first one in the series, uh, most recently here. The other animals looked hard at Toad to see how he would take it. Toad was inclined to be sulky at first, but he brightened up immediately like the good fellow he was. Well, well, he said. Perhaps I am a bit of a talker, a popular fellow such as I am. My friends get round me, we chaff, we sparkle, we tell witty stories, and somehow my tongue gets wagging. I have the gift of conversation, I've been told I ought to have a salon, whatever that may be. Never mind, go on, Badger. How's this passage of yours gonna help us? I've found out a thing or two lately, continued the Badger. I got Otter to disguise himself as a sweep and call at the back door with brushes over his shoulder, asking for a job. There's going to be a big banquet tomorrow night. It's somebody's birthday. Chief Weasels, I believe. And all the weasels will be gathered together in the dining hall, eating and drinking and laughing and carrying on, suspecting nothing. No guns, no swords, no sticks. No arms of any sort, whatever. But the sentinel, all the sentinels will be posted as usual. Exactly. That is my point. The weasels will trust entirely to their excellent sentinels. 
And that is where the passage comes in. That very useful tunnel leads right up under the butler's pantry, next to the dining hall. Aha! Uh -huh. That squeaky board in the butler's pantry! Now I understand it! We shall creep out quietly into the butler's pantry. With our pistols and our swords and sticks. And rush upon them. And whack em and whack em and whack em and whack em! Said the toad in ecstasy, running round and round the room, jumping over the chairs. It's got some hyper. Admire it if he weren't so terrible to everyone. Very well then. Said the badger, resuming his usual dry manner. Our plan is settled, and there's nothing more for you to argue and squabble about. So as it's getting very late, all of you go right off to bed at once. We will make all the necessary arrangements in the course of the morning tomorrow. Toad, of course, went off to bed dutifully with the rest. He knew better than to refuse, though he was feeling much too excited to sleep. But he had had a long day with the ev many events crowded into it, and sheets and blankets were friendly and comforting things, after plain straw, and not too much of it spread on the stone floor of a drafty cell, and his head had not been many seconds on his pillow before he was snoring happily. Naturally, he dreamt about a good deal, about roads that ran away from him just when he wanted them, and canals that chased him and caught him, and barge that sailed into a banqueting hall with his week's washing, just as he was giving a dinner party. And as he was alone in the secret passage, pushing onward, but it twisted and turned round and shook itself and sat up on its end, yet somehow at last he found himself back in Toad Hall, safe and triumphant, with all his friends gathered round him, earnestly assuring him that he was a really a clever Toad. <sighs> well, Legal, if you want to keep calling me adorable and cute, I'll be quite appreciative of it. Thank you for the compliments. Green or blue? Green or blue what, Naruto? He slept till a late hour the next morning, and by the time he got down, he found that the other animals had finished their breakfast some time before. Ah! <laughs> An interesting question, isn't it? The mole had slipped off somewhere by himself without telling anyone where he was going to. The badger sat in the armchair reading the paper and not concerning himself in the slightest about what was going to happen that evening. The rat, on the other hand, was running around the room busily, with his arms full of weapons, every kind, distributing them in four little heaps on the floor, saying excitedly under his breath as he ran, Here's a sword for the rat, here's a sword for the mole, here's a sword for the toad, here's a sword for the badger, pistol for the rat, here's a pistol for the mole, here's a pistol for the toad, here's a pistol for the badger, and so on, in a regular, rhythmical way, while the four little heaps gradually grew and grew. That's all very well, rat, said the badger presently, looking at the busy little animal over the edge of his newspaper. I'm not blaming you, but just let us once get past the stoats with those detestable guns of theirs, and I assure you we shan't want any swords or pistols. We four, with our sticks, once we're inside the dining hall, why, we shall clear the floor of the lot of them in five minutes. I've done the whole thing myself, only I didn't want to deprive you fellows of the fun. <laughs> well, the mods being Naruto so far. <laughs> um, as far as my eyes go, I wanted them to match fairly closely with my what my real life eyes are. Um, and it was quite a while before I learned that uh, my eyes are actually grey. They're neither green nor blue, but they'll appear one or the other, depending on the lighting. So, um, I, I like it that my avatar is not particularly clear on which they are, because it's both and it's neither. Hmm. Mm. Oh, all these guy voices, though, it's getting quite its own thing. Dumpster donuts. You know, I don't think I've heard of those before. What are they, Naruto? It's as well to be on the safe side, 
said the rat reflectively, polishing a pistol barrel on his sleeve and looking along it. The toad, having finished his breakfast, picked up a stout stick and swung it vigorously, belaboring imaginary animals. I'll learn him to steal my house, he cried. I'll learn him. I'll learn him. Oh, literal donuts from the dumpster. Well, I hope that they're quite tasty. Don't say learn em, Toad. That's not good English. What are you always nagging at Toad for? Inquired the badger rather, pre rather peevishly. What's the matter with his English? It's the same what I use myself, and if it's good enough for me, it ought to be good enough for you. I'm very sorry, said the rat humbly. Only I think it ought to be teach him, not learn him. But we don't want to teach him. We want to learn him. Learn him, learn him. And what's more, we're going to do it, too. Oh, very well, have it your way, said the rat. He was getting rather muddled about it himself, and presently he retired to a corner where he could be heard muttering, Learn him, teach him, learn him, teach him, teach him, learn him. So the badger told him rather sharply to leave off. Presently, the mole came tumbling into the room, evidently very pleased with himself. I've been having such fun. I've been getting a rise out of the stoats. <laughs> Hello. Always glad to see hearts and joy in the chat. I hope you've been very careful, Mole, said the rat anxiously. Oh my, cute little angel, coming from someone like you. Those adorable and cute words really do have a specific meaning, don't they? I should hope so, too, said the mole confidently. I got the idea when I went into the kitchen to see about Toad's breakfast being kept hot for him. I found that old washerwoman dress that he came home in yesterday hanging on a towel horse before the fire. And so I put it on in the bonnet as well and shawl. And off I went to Toad Hall as bold as you please. The sentries were on lookout, of course, with their guns and their who comes there and all the rest of their nonsense. Good morning, gentlemen, says I respectful. Want any washing done today? And they looked at me very proud and stiff and haughty and said, Go away, washerwoman, we don't want to do any washing on duty. Or any other time, I says. Ho, 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 wasn't he funny, Toad? <laughs> Gremlin indeed. Is that a knife? I do believe that's a knife you're brandishing in my chat, Angel. Why, frivolous animal, said the toad very loftily. The fact is, he felt exceedingly jealous of the mole for what he had done. It was exactly what he would have liked to have done himself if only he had thought of it first and hadn't gone and overslept himself. Some of the stoats turned quite pink. And sergeant in charge, he said to me very short, like, Now run away, my good woman, run away. Don't keep my men idling and talking on their posts. Run away, says I. It won't be me that'll be running away in a very short time from now. Oh, moly, how could you? The badger laid down his paper. I could see them perking up their ears and looking at each other. One on the mole, and the sergeant said to them, Never mind her, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Oh, don't I? Well, let me tell you this. My daughter, she washes for his badger, and that'll show you whether I know what I'm talking about. And you'll know pretty soon, too. A hundred bloodthirsty badgers armed with rifles are going to attack Toad Hall soon, too. A hundred bloodthirsty... Well, Toad Hall this very night by way of the paddock. Six boatloads of rats with pistols and cutlasses will come up the river and effect a landing on the garden. While well, a picked body of toads, known as the diehards or the death of glory toads, will be to storm the orchard and carry everything off before them, yelling for vengeance. There won't be much left of you to wash by the time they've done with you, unless you clear out while you have the chance. Then I ran away and it was out of sight and I hid. And presently I came creeping back along the ditch and took a peep at them through the hedge. They were all as nervous and flustered as could be, running always at once, falling over each other, and every one giving orders to everybody else and not listening. And the sergeant kept sending off parties of stoats to distant parts of the grounds, and then sending other fellows to fetch him back again. 
and he heard them saying to each other, That's just like the weasels to stop comfortably in the banqueting hall and have feasting and toasts and songs and all sorts of fun. Well, you must stay in guard in the cold, dark, and, and be cut to pieces by bloodthirsty badgers. Uh, yes, Naruto. There was, in fact, a motorcycle outside. Um, along with the lack of uh, echo cancellation, th there's also a fair amount of noise that comes into this room. But it's a nice enough room. And I appreciate being able to, you know, use it. So, there's that. Oh, you silly mole. You've been and spoiled everything. Mole. Said the badger in his dry, quiet way. I perceive you have more sense in your little finger than some other animals have in the whole of their fat bodies. You have managed excellently, and I begin to have great hopes for you. Good mole. Clever mole. The toad was simply wild with jealousy, more especially as he couldn't make out for the life of him what the mole had done that was so particularly clever. But fortunately for him, before he could show temper or expose himself to the badger's sarcasm, the bell rang for luncheon. It was a simple but sustaining meal, bacon and broad beans and macaroni pudding. Uh. I am not used to getting this far into the music and did not realize there was a some with lyrics in it. So, shows what I know. <laughs> and when they had quite done, the badger settled himself into an armchair and said, Well, we've got our work cut out for us tonight and it will probably be pretty late before we're quite through with it. So I'm just going to take 40 winks while I can. And he drew a handkerchief over his face and was soon snoring. The anxious and laborious rat at once redoomed his pre preparations and started running between the four little heaps, muttering, He's about for the rat, he's about for the mole, he's about for the toad, he's about for the badger. And so on, with every fresh accoutrement he produced, to which there seemed really no end. So the mole drew his arm through toads, led him out into the open air, shoved him into a wicker chair, and made him tell him all his adventures from beginning to end, which Toad was only too willing to do. The mole was a good listener, and Toad, with no one to check his statements or to criticize an unfriendly spirit, rather let himself go. Indeed, much that he related belonged more properly to the category of what might have happened had I only thought of it in time instead of ten minutes afterward. Those are always the best and raciest of adventures, and why should it not be truly ours, as much as the somewhat inadequate things that really come off? It seems we may have come to the final chapter here, The Return of Ulysses. I do, however, need just a moment to get something to drink. We've managed upon four hours of this so far, and I appreciate all of you sticking with me through it. <laughs> well, it hasn't been entirely non-stop. Between chapters, I usually take a minute or two, chat with the chat a little bit, and every once in a while somebody incredible comes along, and I get to get a little bit of a thrill from that, too. <laughs> You're right, I do need water, which is uh, what I've been drinking here, uh, even if you can't see my hands. Mm. But I really am quite grateful for everybody who's come along tonight. And, you know, as much as this is a bit of a long trek, it's a long trek that I'm glad to take with all of you. <laughs> What's with the stare, Zoe? Ah, uh, no, I have not been hydrating enough, and that's actually one of the things that will probably end this stream is unless I get my throat properly lubricated, I am going to run out of voice. <laughs> well, I'm glad you've chosen to catch it this time, Angel. 
Naruto, I desperately miss whiskey. Um, it's not something that I necessarily talk about much, but I'm not actually able to drink alcohol. Um, I mean, more precisely, I could start, but if I started, I wouldn't be able to stop. And that, uh, well, it adds a little bit of difficulty sometimes, but I also live a pretty solid life, and I'm glad for it. And the fact that alcohol can't be a part of it, well, I mean, that's about like avocado not being able to be a part of it, which I'm allergic to, so it really doesn't get to be a part of things. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> Alcohol does mess with many medications. You are not wrong. All right. <clears throat> um, my apologies, everybody, but I am going to need just a moment here. Um, and I will be right back. All right, thank you once again for your patience, everyone. I really do appreciate it. And, uh, let's see here. So, um, yes, and with that subject, if you haven't already and you have some maintenance medications to take, please take them. It's important to take care of your health. I'm quite concerned about everyone, just because you're wonderful people. I'm glad you're here, and thank you for joining. And I should probably turn the music down a little bit so it doesn't overwhelm my uh, reading here. But with that, we come to the return of Ulysses. When it began to grow dark, the rat, with an air of excitement and mystery, summoned them back into the parlor, 
stood each of them up alongside his little heap and proceeded to dress them up for the coming expedition. He was very earnest and thorough going about it, and the affair took quite a long time. First, there was a belt to go around each animal, and then a sword to be stuck into the belt. Excuse me. And then a cutlass on the side to balance it. Then a pair of pistols, a policeman's truncheon, several sets of handcuffs, some bandages, and sticking plaster, and a flask and a sandwich case. Badger laughed good-humouredly and said, All right, Ratty. If it amuses you and it doesn't hurt me, I'm going to do all I've got to do since this is with this here stick. But the bat only said, Please, Badger, you know I shouldn't like to blame... You know, I shouldn't like you to blame me afterwards, say I'd forgotten anything. <laughs> Harbinger of Darkness? Hmm. Oh, well, Naruto, you're appreciated all the same. When all was quite ready, the badger took a dark lantern in one paw and grasped his great stick with the other and said, Now then, follow me. Mole first, because I'm very pleased with him. Rat next, toad last. And look here, toady, don't you chatter so much as usual or you'll be sent back as sure as fate. The toad was so anxious not to be left out that he took up the inferior position assigned to him without a murmur, and the animals set off. The badger led them along the, by the river for a little way, then suddenly swung himself over the edge into a hole in the riverbank, a little above the water. The mole and the rat followed silently, swinging themselves successfully into the holes they had seen the badger do. But when it came to Toad's turn, he, of course he managed to slip and fall into the water with a loud splash and a squeal of alarm. He was hauled out by his friends, rubbed down and wrung out hastily, comforted, and set on his legs. The badger was seriously angry and told him the very next time he made a fool of himself, he would most certainly be left behind. So at last, they were in the secret passage, and cutting out expedition had really begun. It was cold and dark and damp and low and narrow, and the poor toad began to shiver, partly from the dread of what might be before him, partly because he was wet through. The lantern was far ahead, and he could not help lagging behind a little in the darkness. Then when he heard the rat call out warningly, Come on, Toad! With such a rush th that he upset the rat into the mole. Oh, a terror seized him of being left behind alone in the darkness, and he came on with such a rush that he upset the rat into the mole and the mole into the badger, and for a moment all was confusion. The badger thought they were being attacked from behind, and there was no room to use a stick or a cutlass, drew a pistol, and was on the point of putting a bullet into Toad. When he found out what had really happened, he was very angry indeed, and said, Now this time that tiresome Toad shall be left behind. But Toad whimpered, and the other two promised that they would be answerable for his good conduct, and at last the badger was pacified, and the procession moved on. Only this time, the rat brought up the rear, with a firm grip on the shoulder of Toad. So they groped and shuffled along, while their ears pricked up and their paws on their pistols, till at last the badger had said, We ought by now to be pretty nearly under the hall. Then suddenly they heard, far away as it might be, and yet apparently nearly over their heads, a confused murmur of sound, as if people were shouting and cheering and stamping on the floor and hammering on tables. The toad's nervous terrors all returned, but the badger only remarked placidly, They are going out at it, the weasels. The passage now began to slope upward. They groped on a little further, and then the noise broke out again, quite distinct this time and very close above them. Hooray! 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 They heard stamping of little feet on the floor and clinking of glasses as little fists pounded on the table. What a time they're having. Come on. They hurried along the passage till they came to a full stop and found themselves standing under the trap door that led up into the butler's pantry. Hello, someone. Thank you for dropping in. It's good to see you. And hope you've had a chance to join and enjoy us tonight.
such a tremendous noise was going on in the banqueting hall that there was little danger of their being overheard. The badgers said, Now, boys, all together. And the four of them put their shoulders into the trapdoor and heaved it back. Hoisting each other up, they found themselves standing in the pantry with only a door between them and the banqueting hall, where their unconscious enemies were carousing. The noise as they emerged from the passage was simply deafening. At last, as the cheering and hammering slowly subsided, a great voice could be made out. Well, I did not propose to detain you much longer. Great applause. But before I resume my seat, renewed cheering, I should like to say one word about our kind host, Mr. Toad. We all know Toad. Great laughter. Good Toad. Modest Toad. Honest Toad. Shrieks of merriment. Only, ju only just let me at him, muttered Toad, grinding his teeth. Hold a minute. Get ready, all of you. Let me sing you a little song, went on the voice, which I have composed on the subject of Toad. A long applause. Then the chief weasel, for it was he, began in a high, squeaky voice. Toad, he went to pleasuring gaily down the street. The badger drew himself up, took a firm grip of his stick with both paws, glanced around at his comrade and cried, Now has come, follow me! And flung the door open wide. My! What a squealing and squeaking and screeching filled the air. Well might the terrified weasels dive under tables and spring madly up at the windows. Well might the ferrets rush wildly for the fireplace and get hopelessly jammed in the chimney. Well might the tables and chairs be upset and glass and china be sent crashing to the floor in the panic of that terrible moment when the four heroes strode wrathfully into the room. The mighty badger, his whiskers bristling, his great cudgel whistling through the air. Mole, black and grim, brandishing his stick and shouting an awful war cry. A mole! A mole! Rat, desperate and determined, his belt bulging with weapons of every age and variety. Toad, frenzied with excitement and injured pride, swollen to twice his ordinary size, leaping in the air and emitting toad whoops that children tell them to the morrow. Toad went to pleasure. Toad went to pleasuring. He yelled. I'll pleasure him. And he went straight for the chief weasel. There were but four in all, but the panic-stricken weasels in the hall had seemed full of monstrous animals, grey, black, brown, and yellow, whooping and flourishing enormous cudgels. And they broke and fled with squeals of terror and dismay, this way and that, through the windows, up the chimney, anywhere to get out of reach of those terrible sticks. The affair was soon over. Up and down the whole length of the hall, strode the four friends, whacking with their sticks at every head that showed itself, and in five minutes the room was cleared. Though the broken windows and the shrieks of terrified weasels escaping across the lawn borne faintly to their ears, on the floor lay prostrate some dozen or so of the enemy, on whom the mole was busily engaged in fitting handcuffs. The badger, resting from his labours, leant on his stick and wiped his honest brow mole he said you're the best of fellows just cut along outside and look after those stoat sentries of yours see what they're doing i've an idea thanks to you we shan't have much trouble from them tonight the mole vanished promptly through the window and the badger bade the other two set a table on its legs again pick up knives and forks and plates and glasses from the debris on the floor and see if they could find materials for supper I want some grub, I do, he said in that rather common way he had of speaking. Stir your stumps, Toad, and look lively. We've got your house back for you, and you don't offer us so much as a sandwich. Toad felt rather hurt that Badger didn't say pleasant things to him, as he had to the mole, and tell him what a fine fellow he was, how splendidly he had fought, for he was rather particularly pleased with himself and the way he'd gone after the chief weasel and sent him flying across the table with one blow of his stick. But he bustled about, and so did the rat, and soon they found some guava jelly in a glass dish, and a cold chicken in a tongue, 
that had hardly been touched, some trifle, and a, quite a lot of lobster salad. And in the pantry they came upon a basket full of French rolls and any quantity of cheese, butter, and celery. They were just about to sit down when the mole clambered through the window, chuckling with an armful of rifles. It's all over, he reported. From what I can make out, as soon as the stoats, who were very nervous and jumpy already, heard shrieks and yells and the uproar inside the hall, some of them threw down their rifles and fled. The others stood fast for a bit, but when the weasels came rushing out upon them, they thought they were betrayed, and the stoats grappled with the weasels, and the weasels fought to get away, and they wrestled and wriggled and punched each other, and rolled over and over, till most of them rolled into the river. They've all disappeared by now, one way or the other, and I've got their rifles, so that's alright. <laughs> Excellent and deserving animal, said the badger, his mouth full of chicken and trifle. Now there's just one more thing I want you to do. Mole, before you sit down to your supper along all of us, I wouldn't trouble you, only I know I can trust you. And, yes, you see a thing done, I, I wish I could say the same with everyone I know. I'd send Rat if he wasn't a poet. I want you to take those fellows to the floor there upstairs with you and have some bedrooms cleaned out and tidied up and made really comfortable. See, they, they sweep under the beds and put clean sheets and pillowcases on and turn down one corner of the bed clothes, just as you know what to be done. And have a can of hot water and clean towels and fresh cakes of soap put in each room. And then you can give them a licking apiece, if that's any satisfaction to you, and put them back out the, by the back door. We shan't see any more of them, I fancy. And then come along and have some of this cold tongue. Oh, straight. I'm very pleased with you, Mole. <laughs> Quite the little laughing emotes. The good-natured Mole picked up a stick, formed his prisoners up in a line on the floor, and gave them the order. Quick march! And led his squad off to the upper floor. After a time, he appeared again, smiling, and said that every room was ready and as clean as they had a liking enough for one night. And the weasels, when I put the point to them, were quite agreed with me and said they wouldn't think of troubling me. Oh. And I didn't have to lick them, either, he added. I thought, on the whole, they had had licking enough for one night, though. And the weasels, when I put the point to them, quite agreed with me and said they wouldn't think of troubling me. They were very penitent and said they were extremely sorry for what they had done. <laughs> Thank you for lurking, cute little angel. But it was all the fault of the chief weasel and the stoats, and if ever they could do anything for us at any time to make up, we had only to mention it. So I gave them a roll apiece and let them out the back, and off they ran as hard as they could. And the mole pulled up his chair to the table and pitched into the cold tongue, and Toad, like the gentleman he was, put all jealousy from him and said heartily, Thank you, kindly dear mole, for all your pains and trouble tonight, and especially for your cleverness this morning. The badger was pleased at that and said, There spoke my brave toad. So they finished their supper in great joy and contentment and presently retired to rest between clean sheets, safe in toad's ancestral home, won back by matchless valor, consummate strategy, and a proper handling of sticks. The following morning, toads, who had overslept himself as usual, came down to breakfast disgracefully late and found on the table a certain quantity of eggshells, some fragments of cold leathery toast, a coffee pot three-fourths empty, and really very little else, which did not tend to improve his temper, considering that, after all, it was his own house. But through the French windows of the breakfast room, he could see the mole and the water rats sitting in wicker chairs out on the lawn, evidently telling each other's stories, roaring with laughter and kicking their short legs up in the air, and Badger, who was in an armchair and deep in the morning paper, merely looked up and nodded when Toad entered the room. But Toad knew his man, so he sat down and made his breakfast the best he could, merely observing to himself that he would get square with the others sooner or later. When he had nearly finished, Badger looked up and remarked rather shortly, I'm sorry, Toad. I'm afraid there's a heavy morning's work in front of you. You see, we really ought to have a banquet at once to celebrate this affair. It's expected of you. In fact, it's the rule. And can confirm, 
If somebody helps you move, you make sure to buy the pizza and the drinks. Oh, uh, all right, said the toad readily. Anything to oblige. Uh, why on earth you should want to have a banquet in the morning, I cannot understand. But you know I do not live to please myself, but merely to find out what my friends want, and then try and arrange it for them, you dear old badger. Don't pretend to be stupider than you really are. And don't chuckle and sputter in your coffee while you're talking, it's not manners. What I mean is the banquet will be to at night, of course. But the invitations will have to be written and got off at once. And you've got to write them. Now sit down at that table, there's stacks of letter paper on it, with Toad Hall in the top in blue and gold. And write invitations to all of our friends. If you stick it to if you stick to it, we shall get them out before luncheon. And I'll bear a hand too, and take my share of the burden. I'll order the banquet. What? cried Toad dismayed. Me stop indoors and write a lot of rotten letters on a jolly morning like this when I want to go ra marry around my property and set everything and everybody to rights and swagger about and enjoy myself? Certainly not. I'll be, I'll see, stop a minute, oh, why, of course, dear Badger, what is my pleasure or convenience compared to the, the others? You wish it done, and it shall be done, go, Badger, order the banquet, order what you like, and join our young friends sitting outside in their innocent mirth, oblivious to me and my cares and toils, I sacrifice this fair morning on the altar of duty and friendship. The Badger looked at him very suspiciously, but Toad's frank open countenance made it difficult to suggest an unworthy motive in this change of attitude. He quitted the room accordingly in the direction of the kitchen, and as soon as the door had closed behind him, Toad hurried to the writing table. A fine idea had occurred to him while he was talking. He would write the invitations, he would take care to mention the leading part that he had taken in the fight, and how he had laid Chief Weasel flat and would hint at his adventures and a career of triumph he had to tell about. On the flyleaf, he would send out a sort of program entertaining for the evening. Something like this, as he sketched out in his head. Speech by Toad. To view his speeches by Toad during the evening. Address by Toad. Synopsis of our prison system, the waterways of old English England horse stealing. The waterways of old England horse stealing, and how to deal property, its rights and its duties. Back to the land, a typical English squire. Song, composed by Toad. About himself. The other compositions... By Toad, will be sung in the course of the evening by the composer. Did I buy the pizza and drinks? Um, yes. Yes, I have. The idea pleased him mightily, and he worked very hard and got all the letters finished by noon, at which hour it was reported to him that there was a small and rather bedraggled weasel at the door, inquiring timidly whether he could be of any service to the gentleman. Toad swaggered out and found it was one of the prisoners of the previous evening, very respectful and anxious to please. He patted him on the head, shoved the bundle of invitations into his paw, and told him to cut along quick and deliver them as fast as he could, and if he'd like to come back again in the evening, perhaps there might be a shilling for him, or again, perhaps there mightn't, and the poor weasel seemed really quite grateful and hurried off eagerly to do his mission. What type of pizza? Um, well... Cross and Easy usually prefer pepperoni pizza, which is really the only type that I'm not particularly fond of. Uh, so for them, it's usually pepperoni pizza. For me, it's usually pineapple and green peppers or sausage, just depending on what I'm feeling that night. The other animals came back to luncheon very boisterous and breezy after a morning on the river. The mole, whose conscience had been pricking him, looked doubtfully at Toad, expecting him to to find him sulky or depressed. Instead, he was so uppish and inflated that the mole began to suspect something, while the rat and the badger exchanged significant glances. As soon as the meal was over, Toad thrust his paws deep into his trouser pockets, remarked casually, Well, look after yourselves, you fellows. Ask for anything you want, and was swaggering off in the direction of the garden, where he wanted to think out an idea or two for his coming speeches, when the rat caught him by the arm. Toad rather suspected what he was after and did his best to get away, but when the badger took him firmly by the other arm, he began to see that the game was up. The two animals conducted him between them into the small smoking room that had opened out of the entrance hall, shut the door, and put him into a chair. Then they both stood in front of him while Toad sat silent, 
and regarded them with much suspicion and ill humor. Pineapple, green peppers, barbecue sauce, mozzarella cheese, pizza crust. The combination is absolutely fantastic. I strongly encourage you to try it. Now look here, Toad. It's about the banquet, and very sorry I am to have to speak to you like this. But I want you to understand clearly once and for all that there are going to be no speeches and no songs. Try and grasp the fact on this occasion we're not arguing with you, but just telling you. Toad saw that he was trapped. They understood him, they saw through him, they'd got ahead of him. His pleasant dream was shattered. Mayn't I sing just one little song? No, not one little song. So it replied the rat, though his heart bled as he noticed the trembling lip of the poor disappointed toad. It's no good, Toady. You know well that your songs are all conceit and boasting and vanity, and your speeches are all self-praise and, and, well, gross exaggeration and... And gas. I swore you were good, Toady, went on the rat. You know you must turn over a new leaf sooner or later, and now seems like a splendid time to begin. A sort of turning point in your career. Please don't think this is a saying all this doesn't hurt me more than it hurts you. Toad remained a long while in thought. At last he raised his head, and the traces of strong emotion were visible on his features. You've conquered, my friends, he said in broken accents. It was, to be sure, but a small thing I asked, merely to leave to blossom and expand for yet one more evening, to let myself go and hear the tumultuous applause that always seemed to me, somehow, to bring out my best qualities. However, you are right, I know, and I am wrong. Henceforth, I will be a very different toad. My friends, you shall never have occasion to blush for me again. Uh, but, oh dear, oh dear, this is a hard world. And pressing his handkerchief to his face, he left the room with faltering footsteps. Badger, I feel like a brute. I wonder what you feel like. Oh, I know, I know, said the badger gloomily. But the thing had to be done. This good fellow has got to live here and hold his own and be respected. Would you have him a common laughing stock, mocked and jeered at by stoats and weasels? Of course not. And talking of weasels, it's like we came upon that little weasel just as he was setting out with Toad's invitations. I suspected something from what you told me, and had a look at one or two that was simply disgraceful. I confiscated the lot, and a good mold is now sitting in the blue boudoir, thinning up a plain, simple invitation cards. At last, the hour of the banquet began to draw near, and Toad, who on leaving the others had retired to his bedroom, was still sitting there, melancholy and thoughtful. His brow resting on his paw, he pondered long and deeply. Gradually, his countenance cleared, and he began to smile long, slow smiles. Then he took to giggling in a shy, self-conscious manner. At last, he got up, locked the door, and drew the curtain across the windows, collected all the chairs in the room and arranged them in a semicircle, and took his position in front of them, swelling visibly. Then he bowed, off twice, and letting himself go with uplifted voice, he sang to the enraptured audience that his imagination so clearly saw Toad's last little song. A Toad came, a Toad came home. There was panic in the parlors and howling in the halls. There was crying in the cow sheds and shrieking in the stalls. When Toad came home. When the toad came home, there was smashing in of window and a crashing on the door. There was shivying of weasels that fainted on the floor when the toad came home. Bang go the drums, trumpeters are tooting, and the soldiers are saluting, and the cannon they are shooting, and the motor cars are hooting as the hero comes. Shout hooray, and let each one of the crowd try and shout it very loud. 
In honor of an animal whom you're justly proud for its toad's great day. He sang this very loud with great unction and expression, and when he had done, he sang it all over again. Then he heaved a deep sigh, a long, long, long sigh. Then he dipped his hairbrush in the water jug, parted his hair in the middle, and plastered it down very straight and sleek on each side of his face, and unlocking the door, went quietly down the stairs to greet his guests, who he knew must be assembling in the drawing room. All the animals cheered when he entered, and crowded round to congratulate him and say nice things about his courage and his cleverness and his fighting qualities. But Toad only smiled faintly and murmured, Not at all, or sometimes for a change, On the contrary. Otter, who was standing on the hearth rug, describing to an admiring circle of friends exactly how he would have managed things had he been there, came forward with a shout, threw his arms around Toad's neck, and tried to take him round the room in triumphal process. But Toad, in a mild way, was rather snubby to him, remarking gently as he disengaged himself, Badgers was the mastermind. Mole and the water rat brought the brunt of the fighting. I merely served in the ranks and did little or nothing. The animals were evidently puzzled and taken aback by this unexpected attitude of his, and Toad felt, as he moved from one guest to the other, making his modest responses, that he was an object of absorbing interest to everyone. The badger had ordered everything of the best, and the banquet was a great success. There was much talking and laughter and chaff among the animals, but through it all, the toad, who of course was in the chair, looked down his nose and murmured pleasant nothings to the animals on either side of him. At intervals, he stole a glance at the badger and the rat, and always, when he looked, they were staring at each other with their mouths open. This gave him the greatest satisfaction. Some of the younger and livelier animals as the evening wore on got whispering to each other uh, that things were not so amusing as they used to be in the good old days, and there were some knockings on the table and cries of, Toad! Speech! Speech from the Toad! Song! Mr. Toad's song! The Toad only shook his head gently and raised one paw in mild protest, and by pressing delicacies on his guests, by topic of small talk, and by earnest inquiries after members of their family not yet old enough to appear at social functions, managed to convey to them that this dinner was being run on strictly conventional lines. He was indeed an altered toad. After this climax, the four animals continued their lead on their lives, so rudely broken in upon by civil war, in great joy and contentment, undisturbed by further risings or invasions. Toad, after due consideration with his friends, selected a handsome gold chain and locket set with pearls, which he dispatched to the jailer's daughter, with a letter that even the badger admitted to be modest, grateful, and appreciative. And the engine driver, in his turn, was properly thanked and compensated for all his pains and trouble under severe compulsion from the badger. Even the barge woman was, with some trouble, sought out, and the value of her horse discreetly made good to her, though Toad kicked terribly at this, holding himself to be an instrument of fate sent to punish fat women with mottled arms who couldn't tell a real gentleman when they saw one. The amount involved, it was true, was not very burdensome, the traveler's valuation being admitted by local assessors to be approximately correct. Sometimes, in the course of long summer evenings, the friends would take a stroll together in the wild wood, now successfully tamed so far as they were concerned, and it was pleasing to see how respectfully they were greeted by the inhabitants, and how the mother weasels would bring their young ones to the mouths of the holes and say, pointing, Look, baby, there goes the great Mr. Toad, and there's the gallant water rat, a terrible fighter, walking along on him, and yonder comes the famous Mr. Mole, of whom you have quite often heard your father tell. But when their infants were facetious and quite beyond control, they would quiet them by telling them how if they didn't hush and base and light, hush, hush them and not fret them, the terrible grey badger would get up them. This was a base libel on badger who cared little about society, but was rather fond of children, but it never failed to have its full effect. And so we come to the end of The Wind in the Willows. <laughs> Qu 
quite a group of friends, this has been. So, once again, a big thank you to Tiny Foxtrot for encouraging me to read this particular book. I think it's been a very nice event. Um, thank you to everybody who's come out and joined me for the night here. Um, honestly, I'm taken aback. You've all been very supportive, very kind, and I, I just cannot express my appreciation strongly enough. You don't see an otter in the picture? Well, what's that then? Or, I suppose you can't see my cursor, but... <laughs> in the right, we have the badger. Next to him, the water rat. Next to that, the mole. And then, on the far side of the blanket, an otter. At least I certainly hope it's an otter. Oh, you see an otter in the picture. Yes, uh, the otter was a minor character throughout this, but certainly was present. Um, earlier in the night, we got to hear how the otter's child was saved by a spirit of the forest. We got to see the otter show up a couple of times, just to act as a... Uh... Oh, am I about to get otter here? Hmm. Actually, it's still fairly early in the night. Um, honestly, I could probably keep going for a little bit here. Uh, although I'll definitely need a drink. <laughs> but, moreover, what would people in chat want to see if I did keep going? I'm certainly open to things. Oh, you'd like me to talk about my childhood. <laughs> You're right. I did say if there was time at the end, I would talk about my childhood a bit. And I suppose there's no real harm in it. Um, oh boy. Where do I want to begin on this? <laughs> well, I think we should first start by updating some things here. And we'll go ahead and turn the book off while we're at it. And since I'm doing these things, and I doubt Legal has much of an interest in protesting at this point, let's uh, turn off the cute box. All right. So, and to talk just a little bit about my childhood, um, I suppose there's not really any harm in admitting this. Um, I am in my 30s, um, and so a lot of my time growing up was spent in the 90s and the early 2000s. Um, and so, back when I was little, um, my parents had been working and my dad decided to go back and uh, start earning a master's degree. And around the same time that he decided this, uh, my little sister was born. So my parents went from two incomes and no kids to having no real income and two children. Um, and it made for a little bit of a tight time there, but not a terrible one. Um, and my parents moved in at this time with my father's parents. So my grandmother and grandfather. Um, now my grandfather was an engineer and would often be off taking care of some important thing or another, but my grandmother was somebody who had been a school teacher in her youth. And so with me and my little sister present, she was more than happy to take on some of these teaching roles once again. She would read me all kinds of stories, many of them ones that I wouldn't come to properly understand for years or decades later, but that didn't stop her. Um, she was just happy to share this love of reading, of a little bit of acting, of stories, and the worlds within. 
um, to be able to present those to me and my baby sister just as a natural matter of how we would go through the day. Now, I know there were televisions in the household, and occasionally we might watch an episode or two on the television, but for the most part, television really didn't become a feature of my childhood until, oh, I was probably in primary school at that point. Um, just because there wasn't a need. Cable television at this point was still a fairly expensive prospect, and my parents, being, you know, in the middle of trying to deal with limited income and, uh, you know, student expenses and things of that nature, um, they really didn't have the option of showing a lot of television to begin with. So we would go for walks, we would go out to the park, uh, my grandmother would read stories to us, and she also, having been a Girl Scout leader and a teacher for very long, would do things like finger plays with us, songs. Um, even today, uh, as I've switched over to, um, to doing more social work, to engaging with children more, there are things that I'm grateful to have, uh, and that resonate quite strongly with me. Unfortunately, my camera is not set up in such a way that I can use my hands. I can't really show you the finger plays of things like, this is the church, this is the steeple. But they are things that, when I do them with children, give them a chance to calm down, to refocus, or even just to be entertained for a little bit. And I'm delighted to be able to share that with the people here, with the people who have never had that experience, and with the ones who might be able to take that experience one day and share it with someone else. <laughs> I'm glad you know the finger play, Caffrey. And along with that, my she was uh, part of a historical society. She was often volunteering at all kinds of different things. So I would get taken to different museums, um, some that had to do with my family's heritage, some that had to do with the heritage of the area that she lived in, um, and some of them that were just entertaining to go to, something that gives us an insight into some other people's lives and ways that they've lived. And all of it just cultivated a lovely fascination for such things in me. It was also something that uh, my mother would often cook. And today she still very much has food as a main focus in her life. But at the time she was a cook who would just take care of simple things around the household. And watching my mother cook and my grandmother tell stories, those influenced some things that I really love in my own life today. And so the first few years uh, were spent mostly around my parents and my grandparents. And eventually my dad did manage to get his master's degree. And so we moved cities so that he could pursue a PhD in a related field. Um, oh, that's good to hear. Naruto, you'll have to show me some of those finger plays sometime. I'd be delighted to share with some other people and like I said, learning is something that I'm quite fond of. Any rate, so once we moved, um, I was actually enrolled in a Catholic school for a while, and that colored some things. So up until that point, I had been leaning toward using my left hand, but the penmanship courses that they taught there, um, and particularly the cursive ones, if there was any option to use your right hand, the instructors would push that. And so while I'd started out as, you know, probably left-handed, I ended up using my right through those lessons because it was simply easier than being scolded routinely. And so to this day, I actually am on the ambidextrous side, um, and just because that's what the lessons did. But, uh, you know, that's where the schooling was, and um, 
you know, as time went by, my parents had been uh, continuing on, but both my sister and I reached school age, and it began to make more sense for my mother to look into doing some work again. So she started working at a bank, and my father, who was a student, uh, became the one who would bring us home and take care of us in the afternoons. Now, of course, I did not know that that can damage my hands, but uh, very good to know, Naruto. My dad, while very much a storyteller in his own right, uh, had a different way of engaging with us. He had been doing his studies for quite a while, and was more used to attending to a university lecture than he was to children. And while, yes, he absolutely had a variety of stories, um, his way of telling included using different voices. Um, quite often, when I was growing up, we would see things like uh, the Three Billy Goats Gruff. And when he would tell that particular tale, um, well, I may as well just tell it now, we're, we're already talking about such things. He told the tale as long ago, there were a pair of green hills covered in grass. Between these hills was a deep ravine. Across the ravine was a bridge, and under the bridge lived a terrible troll. On one of the hills lived three billy goats, who would blaze about in the sun and eat the green grasses. One day, the smallest billy goat decided it was tired of eating the grass on this hill, and it would instead go across the bridge to the other hill. And so he started off across the bridge, clip, clop, clip, clop, clip, clop, when from under the bridge came a sound. And this part, I haven't heard other people using, although I suspect it must come from somewhere. But the way my dad would always say this part was, I'm the troll, foldy roll, I'm the troll, foldy roll, I'm the troll, foldy roll, and I'll eat you for supper. And that was just one of the things he did. I never heard the man sing outside of this, but that particular bit, he would sing in this loud, deep, drawling tone. And the rest of the time would use his standard professor voice for the story. And of course, so we can tell the rest of the story if chat really wants to hear it. But my father, through using his voice like that, got me thinking about how I could use my own voice. And honestly, was a big piece of why I have such a wide range today. So he would tell us bedtime stories, but he would also tell us different lectures and things that he'd been working on in his studies. Which sounds a little bit silly until you remember that, I mean, my grandmother had been reading Hans Christian Andersen stories to me at three years old. Clearly, it didn't matter if I fully understood, it was about spending time with him. And so he would tell us stories of, like, how he was working on exams. And he'd give the question, why would you not want to do 100% testing on explosive cowbells? And, of course, my instinct would be, well, I mean, there's probably some efficiencies to be gained there. You don't want to test every single one of them. Once you've tested a certain number, they're probably all good. My little sister, of course, came up with the far better answer of... They explode. If you test all of them, you don't have any left. So, my little sister certainly got the better of me with that. But that was the kind of thing he would do. Another time, he would take me down with him when he went to the university and would work in the lab. And so, at those occasions, uh, he would show me how to do things like, uh, oh, I believe it was actually Excel. Uh, but we used it in order to make some time-lapse animations. So I managed to make a clock at, you know, five years old on the computer. And now computers weren't so terribly new of a thing. The Apple II had been out for, a, you know, better part of a decade by that point. Well, probably more than a decade. I think the Apple II was the 70s. But 
but personal computers were still not something that was in every household out there. And so as a result, um, my father having a computer in the home was something that really helped me to get interested in them. Um, so knowing how to use Excel at that point was quite impressive as a feat. Um, Excel wasn't all that old. Um, separately, he also took me in and showed me how to use the robotic arm. And so I got to use a robot to pick things up and place them in different pla positions and move them about. You know, as one would do. Um, but this was all things that I got to do as part of spending my time with my father in his manufacturing lab. So, um... Hmm. Looks like we might have taken a bit of a quality hit here. Um, I'm noticing some buffering on my uh, stream manager. Is everyone out there having an okay time with uh, reading things and listening to me? Um, I'm just going to catch up with chat here while I wait for a response. Probably better if you're in an early age. If you're left-handed, use your left hand. Having to use the other hand is more uncomfortable and can hurt your hands. It's very true. Um... And it doesn't have as much of an effect on me, but yeah, it has an effect. There's a reason I'll usually switch over to using my left hand. Glad to hear it's doing well, Naruto. Um, but yes, it, it's also a coordination issue. Um, you'll notice I don't play much for the bang bang shooty games. I, I'm not very good at using things that way. Okay, I'll assume it was just my internet that decided to have a bit of a go on me. But yeah, so... Along with being able to spend time in the laboratory, um, oh, Zoe, I'm glad to hear you're alive. It's, it's really good to hear from you. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, so, um, in terms of, uh, yeah, we, we just, we did things. Um, and sometimes he would also be the one to take us out in the afternoons, but that graduate student schedule allowed him to spend more time with me and my little sister during those days. Um, and eventually he also managed to get that PhD. And once he did, we moved again. Um, he would be teaching at different universities uh, throughout the rest of my years growing up and so uh you know we, we moved around a little bit um usually a few years here a few years there um but it also gave me a chance to spend more time experiencing different places and different cultures another thing that it caused was because we were so far away from where our family had been I began to get used to traveling at a fairly early age. Um, what did my mom do? Uh, so at the time that my dad was still in grad school, she was working at a bank. Um, now I didn't know exactly what she was doing. I believe it was somewhere in the finance department, but I mean, this was many years ago and it was something that she only did for a couple of years while dad finished up his education. So, um, it's a little hard for me to say exactly what she was doing. I just know that she worked for one of the local banks. Um, and yeah, during that time, she would also still very much be responsible for like cooking and cleaning, and taking care of things. And she'd still spend time with us. Um, a lot of the time, mom would sing to us at night uh, if we were able to catch her before everyone needed or before. Uh, it was time for us all to have already been asleep. And the singing was quite nice. Um, it gave me an idea of what to sing, and I also learned a few lullabies from that. There are a few that I still sing to this day. Um, if you ever hear me breaking into Ali Bali B or Over in the Meadow, those are songs that mom used to sing to me. And that I've been singing to my son and to people who just need a little bit of help going to sleep because sometimes you know sleep is hard to get to it's difficult to let go of that wakefulness so um 
And of course, throughout all of this, I also was very much a night owl. <laughs> yes, Naruto, I have a son. Um, and he, he is not, uh, he does not live with me. Um, and there's a long story there that I don't really want to get into on stream. But, yes, I have a son. And, yes, I've sung to him, I've told him stories. I've done my best to make sure that he has the best childhood I can. And for my own part, I learned to read quite early on. Um, whether that was because of all the reading going on in my household or something else, it's hard to say. Um, but by about three, four years old, I could read some fairly simple books, and by about five, I was reading chapter books. Um, and so it was something that I would do late at night um, because it would get dark, but I was allowed to have a nightlight. Oh, wow, my parents should not have let me have a nightlight. I would stay up until long after they had gone to sleep, just quietly reading in my room. And the stories were different sorts of things. They, they weren't anything too extravagant. Um, I had a collection of stories about some different animals who wandered around and did things in their own pastoral community. Um, things like... Uh, Oh, Goosebumps became one of my favorites a little later on in time. I am a night owl. I don't think that necessarily <laughs> means I'm an owl owl, Catherine. <laughs> oh, I suppose you might see me that way, though. <laughs> Silly. Mm. And that's good to know that you can switch back and forth yourself, Catherine. They're very nice things. I'm... <laughs> ah! <laughs> Zoe, thank you! <laughs> Owl mom, 100%. Alright, alright. <laughs> I suppose we're accepting this, anyway. Oh, goodness. Um... But, yeah, so... It, it was quite common for me to stay up into the wee hours of the morning. There were several times I even just pulled an all-nighter before hitting eight years old. But that was just how I liked to do it. Nighttime has always been a good time for me. And early mornings? Ugh. Caffrey! I see what you did there, and no, I'm not going to switch accents just because I've seen that written on a page. Oh dear. Um, at any rate. So we moved around a fair bit as I was growing up, but uh, those long journeys were also a place where I got a chance to not only read stories, but have them read to me. My mother would often pick a longer book for such travels, so we began to read things like His Dark Materials, or Artemis Fowl, uh, The Princess Bride, and Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. All of these were things that I had read to me as part of our travels, as part of going about the world and doing different things. Um, and those long road trips also taught me some very good things, because this was before the days of GPS. This was before the days of Google Maps. And uh, cell phones existed, but oh boy, we didn't use them at this point. So you had to arrange your travel in advance, make sure people knew where you were going to be, because if you got into an accident, there wasn't a way out. Um, and so my parents taught me how to use a map, how to navigate along long distances and the different highways and roads and byways, and how to watch out for things. Um, honestly, it's something that I'm still very grateful to have because Google Maps doesn't always do a very good job. And I'm always amused and delighted when I get a chance to take a look at a proper map of a city or of a state and just find a route that allows me to go faster or allows me to go with less uh, fuel consumption. But, I mean, those traveling trips, uh, the camping that went along with them, 
reading stories, these are places that I spent most of my time growing up. And eventually, yes, my parents did spring for a Game Boy for us, um, as well as a Sega Genesis. And those video games became a huge part of my childhood as well. A lot of my spare time that wasn't spent either reading or taking care of things uh, would be spent playing those kinds of games. Yes, Caffrey, I'm well aware of your position in the continents versus island life. But it's true, living on continents and having places that you can move to distantly by car is quite the experience. <laughs> Moreover, um, hello, Rage. Yes, little pets for the one on the lap. You've got this. Um, but a lot of those were things that I was experiencing growing up. <laughs> Whether those things were from, you know, the video games that I played, the stories that I read, you'll also notice that I'm not necessarily talking about a lot of friends and going out and doing things with them. Because generally speaking, I just didn't make friends at that age. Um, for me, it was a lot more about getting to spend time in the world and doing things. And taking care of myself um you know I, I was a pretty selfish child that's very fair to say and so keeping to myself in those reclusive places it, it just felt more normal more natural um loud noises both then and to some extent now are not a huge thing for me and as naruto has pointed out in the past i'm not the most thrilling person at a party i'm Capable as a performer, I, I think that's an acceptable thing to say. Um, and I'm capable of interacting with people in one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one type situations. But I don't handle parties well. They're, they're just not the direction that I usually would like to go. Um, so I, I get distracted... It's hard for me to find places to get a word in edgewise, and ultimately it's just not a very enjoyable experience. So I'm far more likely to stick with two or three people at most, and spend time with the people that I care about. Or to get on a proper stage and broadcast to everyone. Because the world is a stage. <laughs> any rate, I don't know if those are the kinds of stories that you were hoping to hear, Naruto. But hopefully it gives you some idea why things like uh, Star Wars or a lot of the television shows that were common to other people are not necessarily things I experienced. That parties and social gatherings where a lot of people pick up their uh, taste for certain elements of language were not a part of things simply because I had my focus elsewhere. And honestly, I've been kind of not regretting that so much. It's nice to be able to live my life without having to feel trapped or tied down in some of those ways. But it also means that I won't always understand when someone's talking. And I've accepted that. I also have an interest in learning more about different people, different cultures, different ways of doing things. So it gives me an opportunity to learn. And I like that. I like being able to learn new things and find new ways of doing and thinking. So, there are some stories from my childhood. Um, oh my, and I've forgotten to drink again. <laughs> we are getting to be about five hours into things at this point. So, I'd like to put it to the audience here. Would you like to see me continue on for a little bit? Or would you like to have me raid out here and let you move on to some of your own different things? Certainly hate to tie everybody up for too long, but at the same time I've got a little time left in me. Mm, I'm a little voice if I can get my throat hydrated. <laughs>
All right. We've got at least Rage's vote for letting all of you go on to your other things. <laughs> well, Zoe, if you behave very well, it just might be you. I have to see. But you know me. See me after class. <laughs> I'm glad you're enjoying lurking, Caffrey. I've been squawking all day. Oh my goodness, Naruto. I like to think my voice isn't quite a squawk, at least for most of it. Hmm. Well, and that went right down my front. Oh, dear. Hmm. Alright, I think I am making an executive decision here, though. Uh... Because I'm having a hard enough time drinking that I suspect my fatigue may be setting in. So, we need to find a raid target. Uh, let's see here. Does anybody in the audience have a suggestion? Because if not, I will probably just pick someone here. Mm, excuse me. I'll give it just a moment, but, uh... Alright. <laughs> Naruto, if you need to see me after class, we can certainly arrange for that, although I'm not entirely certain what you'd like to discuss. You also know that my DMs are always open to you, so if you need something, just let me know. We'll talk from there. And it does sound like you've had some questions. So, you're more than welcome to see me after class. But I'm not necessarily seeing any suggestions come across in chat. So, let's see who I've got on my list to raid. Not much. It seems I've gone late enough that I actually don't have many people here to raid. Well, uh, that aside... All right, well, it looks like Lexi is currently doing Pajama Sam, and that sounds reasonably close to what I've been doing, so we'll give her a try. Um, bear in mind, though, that Lexi is an 18-plus streamer, so uh, if you have come here expecting something a little bit more gentle, uh, unfortunately, this late at night, I don't have much for similar-minded people, so I hope that you enjoyed the time all the same. Um, <laughs> thank you all for the support, every lovely chatter who's dropped in, and I hope very much to see you all the next time that I uh, come through here. Um, after a stream this long, I am probably going to have to take a couple days to let my voice rest, um, but I know we are looking to do some... Uh, We'll likely do some Final Fantasy IV together, uh, Captain Cross and I. So, uh, be looking out for that. I will post that in the usual channels. Um, and for those who are... Oh, did that cancel the raid? Heck. Okay. Uh, for those who are interested in seeing some of the videos on demand, I do have a YouTube channel. Um, it's not real heavily populated. But it is something that I would be more than delighted to have people drop in for. So if you'd like to check out the videos on demand or things of that nature, uh, there is a link. And I will be trying to set up something like a Patreon or a Ko-Fi or uh, one of the num numerous ones that uh, you know exist there. 
so that if people do want to support me, they can send some things my way and make sure I have enough to cover rent and groceries in a month. Really appreciate it. So, we will be raiding out to Lexi here. Thank you everybody for joining me, and I hope you have a wonderful night here, whatever direction you go. Good night.